And now, international rangers with a value from the USA, digital whiskey from Belgium, and V from the United Kingdom, here to shoot the shit and get some answers. Recording started. So this is awesome because it's actually started three separate tracks recording right now. Yep. Which is fantastic. That'll be so much easier. And then I can play with the sound levels and the international ranges can be cool and good and well produced and things. Mm. Yeah, so if anybody's listening and annoyed by that, by the previous recording, that's all on me. I just drew the separate tracks in Mumble and made one file of them. If you're really annoyed about it, just go to uh, the Internet Archive. I uploaded all the tracks separately. Go figure it out for yourself, okay? Uh, and hopefully in sync. Yeah, that is the Somebody's thing about... going to bitch in the comments like, yeah. not... all these people are out of sync. I can't deal with this. Oh, Here's a solution. That's so the thing about Rangers, though, isn't it? I mean, you get people that, you know, the, the mad thing about the, the people that do watch the videos and do listen to the radio show is they will go away and do shit like that. <laughs> oh, okay, guys, I re-edited it. Here. Here's the new link. Just Do you want to download it to put it onto YouTube? It's like, okay. You know, the number of people that have stepped in and just done stuff, and it's just like, that is so cool. You know, I I mean, I'm still... Yeah. Johnny's a devil. Mm -hmm. Fritz it. Oh, <laughs> Fritz, Fritz. Buy guns. Fritz, Fritz, Fritz. Canned food. Fritz, Fritz, Fritz. Store just... water. You idiots. Oh, it amazes can't believe that Just listen to me thing. in reverse. Uh, now there's been two instances the backwards in the last masking two messages, years and it'll be all beginning. Where, when I've talked to people about storing water, they've taken the piss. <laughs> or when um, Chaos Bunny talked to people about storing water in emergencies, <laughs> they would take the piss. And two of those people have had to come over to borrow water. Did your did your water get cut off? Yes. Did you know? Yes. Did you do anything about it? No. <laughs> and you're English. Now you've got to try and make tea. Good luck with that. Hmm. That's you totally fucked, innit? <laughs> I don't drink a lot of tea, but it is very refreshing Idiots. if you do it right. And I've heard horror stories from English people that have gone to America and gone, they do this. They bring it to you with the milk in the bottle first. <laughs> You're fucked with all that tea drinking, man. I haven't experienced it myself, but uh, Belgium is known for its good chocolates. Um, if you're abroad and some Belgium comes to you, don't give them chocolates. Oh, yeah. We I know what good shit is. Yeah. Your shit they tastes like probably know what newspaper. good chocolate is. Yeah, we just and drink they don't soda, make that's why we're all they, they, obese. It really is. It's next to impossible <sighs> to buy crappy chocolate in Belgium, because I think you just be mm -hmm. stoned to death in the streets. Well, actually it is, but, you know, we don't advertise that stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, oh. actu uh, yeah, it's if you go to touristy places and you can buy like a package of whatever random you know, hmm. deluxe, whatever, just tourist trap sort of stuff. Yeah, that's garbage. Mm. Do not buy that. Do not eat that. I did see a movie once where somebody, like chocolate. It somebody got stopped at the, Brazili at the Brazilian airport for bringing in instant coffee. And the Brazilian guy looks at him and just goes, we do. One of the things we do have is coffee, like a lot of it. So I want you to take that jar of instant coffee, go over to that bin, and I'm not letting you into the country until you've tipped it into the bin, opened it up and tipped it into <laughs> the bin. You may not bring that into this country. It's like proper offended. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I have instant coffee. I've got the lowest possible grade of instant coffee so it can sit there in jars without me touching it much. Because I know, I, especially if you're on vacation, I mean. But it's sort of like you know, it's it's so it's relatively cheap. For, if you on. can get some really cheap instant Enjoy coffee, enjoy yourself in a little it. bit. It's, it's don't drinkable. Subject yourself to instant coffee. For when you coffee, absolutely you gotta have, have to. coffee, you'll appreciate it. But that's the kind of coffee it is, and the rest is all just you know ground coffee, and not expensive. Ground oh, coffee I, I've as got well. some too, either. and it's you know, like any ground old, coffee is I better than any it. instant coffee. <laughs> you know that they're they're not even the same drink. Oh, Kevin is a geek, as must own every single coffee-making appliance it's possible to own. Um, and some of the rarest, weirdest coffees. 
and uh, yeah, he the reason he owns nearly one of every single coffee making yep. device is that he actually had filter coffee once and really liked it, and he was so astonished. He was on this quest then to make the perfect cup of coffee, and it's all like, oh wow, <laughs> no kidding, you know, like he was almost OCD about it, and he just owned it's like he's bought an Aero, I think he bought an AeroPress, a filter coffee machine, a, a Tassimo or whatever, one of those ones that sort of put, uses the pods, and fucking everything. No, yeah, actually. Yeah. No. I kind of know the story. Have I just I like, like a lot of things that are technically now historical that you're you're alive gonna, and an adult. He's going to be Ian McKellen or whoever. You know, it seems a bit weird to Black watch. Down TV. It's really strange when I watch you know typing. films about the Falkland War or the Gulf War. You haven't seen Black you know, Hawk Down. I totally remember Jesus, all these Rick, major Rick points. You know, just this this is so strange. Yeah. <coughs> well, the most difficult part about history is knowing that you're in it. Yeah, I mean it's always happening, isn't it? I mean Trump could That's... have said Trump could have said something today that was just so astonishing, like an actual declaration of war, and we don't know because it's you know he yeah. hasn't done it yet. You know, and we're we're sitting here talking about how weird it was. Then it would be extra weird now that we've mentioned it. If it were to suddenly de that just blew my mind. Oh, I, I can't. I can't watch the news. Yeah, I'm kind of. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually a kind of in a time warp because a uh, to something. All the news right, that I have, in the morning, I'll check the Guardian unfortunately, website. is just give it a quick skim. Uh, a day behind, or and then log off. I have to wait until because I've started reading some streaming really, it. You know, and even I online news stream at the right time. They're after such a it's... wide audience, wider than yeah. they used to be, to get those number of clicks through and get advertising seen and stuff like that. Um, they write some really, really, some articles where you just think, oh, wow, what a crappily written article or what a pointless thing to, to waste my time with. But there was, a, there was a woman that wrote an article for The Guardian, so got paid to write an article about how she, she thought that the song Let It Go in Frozen was a good song as far as songs went. But she didn't approve of the outfit that the woman that was singing about being independent and strong and being able to shrug off fucking everything. It was like a really good message for a Indeed. princess movie for little girls. You know, what a good piece of advice that will just stick in their heads when they're about six. And they might have a happier life just to go, oh, you know what, fuck this noise. You know, that's probably the most important thing that you can learn as an adult. Is to be able to go, I don't need this and just leave. Or just leave a situation and go, no. No, I'm not actually stuck here. I'm a grown-up. Mm -hmm. I'm an independent human being. I don't have to subject myself to this bullshit. And teaching children to be able to do that is just really important. <laughs> because they'll never put up with someone being abusive to them. If, even if that's, you know, if they were to just, you know, just even if one in a million yeah. women that are, are being hassled or got at by a partner, I'm saying women yeah. specifically because it is quite a girly movie, just goes, you know what, fuck this noise and just leaves. That movie with that song with that message could save a few lives, and I don't think I'm I'm underplaying. I think you know yeah. the, the ability to just go now. And anyway, so this really good message for little girls that was just being beamed at them, and they love the movie. They watch it all the time, and she goes, "Well, I just think her, you know, the dress that she's wearing in that is a bit slutty." And it's literally so the dress, and I watched it because I was like, "Is it?" I don't remember it being like mm. that because I've seen the clip, and the the skirt has got like a, a slit up to the knee scandalous and this is not this is not a woman in like mozambique or you know uh you know uh, somewhere like thailand or somewhere where you know public morality is a huge <laughs> thing this was a middle class white woman living in london There's and i thought problem. is it is that me just being un insensitive mm. and just not tolerating people that are being <laughs> snowflakey and i looked in the comments and just every one of them was like you snobby bitch you know, you're trying to slut shame Elsa from Frozen. Fuck off. Get a life. Right. Like, of all the things that you could find offensive that your children are exposed to, like intolerance and racism and shit like that, 
of all the things you could think to say, I don't think I'll let my children do dot, dot, dot. And he's just like, wow. Yeah. Really? You know, at what, <laughs> an at animated what point character. Do you, you know, you see her calf and her ankle. And it's just like, I can understand if she was doing it in a, like a lame bikini or shit like that. But she's wearing an evening dress. And it's just like, oh, fuck off. Really? It's the, you know, the, and you felt compelled to, to, to put photon to screen. In, all, in order to warn people of the dangers of someone not not essentially wearing, you know, a head-to-toe gown. Yeah, she's wearing a couple of, you know, scallop shells. And yeah. It's like, no. You just think, can, can you imagine... Well, can you imagine, so you're you're trying to be nice at someone else's house when they're giving you dinner. Well, if Ariel and... And I always try and be polite, what, but I uh, sometimes do get triggered. The Little Mermaid wasn't scandalous? I mean, uh, uh, why are And we I have to just go, this? oh, no, this is where I don't ever get invited back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell him that. This, at this point, Pasties. I understand if I never get to eat here again. I, I completely understand. I just, I can't let that just sit. That bollocks yeah <laughs> you know and this is why i don't carry guns or shit like that this is why i shouldn't be near weapons of any kind <laughs> ever because generally speaking you get more this than 10 the people together in a room and one of them's gonna piss me off and it's just like oh just with the next meetup let's play a game how long head. does it take for me to start <laughs> killing people <laughs> i see that's the problem if you're left wing there's a bit of me that I know. Should I zero in on that site? And if you know, I'm quite good at recognizing people as human. So the problem with being, you know, a sniper type killer, speaking is of, is that you don't get to really get a, the gist, the gist of that person. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd probably, you know, I'd want, I'd want to know, I'd want to hear that person speak before I decided whether or not it was okay to delete them from history. And just go no, but I think you know certain people. It's fair. I think certain people is just like I cannot be around you, armed at all, because you know some people are just fucking despicable. What, did, I must have told you about when we went to the to speak at the to speak with the people at the salon in Manchester. It's like a sort of like glorified after dinner discussion group. When when they I don't start, remember these guys started talking about um, basic um, universal income, you know, and how mm -hmm. automation is going to probably bring about a need for it. So we thought, oh, that's an interesting. So me and Maxine went. Or me and the Chaos Bunny went down. Uh, vaguely, we go toddling in there. You have to you had to buy a ticket and shit. So we paid our five quid online and stuff, and we turned up. And it was basically a whole bunch of really middle class mm. people congratulating themselves on the fact that, that no, they shouldn't have to pay taxes for it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, what? yeah, so they didn't agree with it because you shouldn't, there's no such thing as free money and you shouldn't just get money off the state under any circumstances. <sighs> and it's just like, well, yeah, yeah, it's it's like it's like going to a Daily Mail Daily Mail book mm. readers group. Yeah, it's mad. So of course, Chaos Bunny and me were basically tag teaming ourselves in to terrify the shit out of these people because they're all trying to be genteel and we're like, oh, don't even fucking step towards me. So do they go there every wearing, week and wearing, complain about everything to, that's tax funded? Because I mean, that'd be a full time. Stay hobby. in that seat. Oh, yeah, how man. much do they get? They get we went cost. to we went to town on them. You know, they were going, oh, well, it's never really been tried. We knew all three studies of it being tried, you know, when and where they were taking place and all this sort of thing. We just hammered them with fact. They hadn't even read anything into it. And then we started oh. terrifying them by things. When they said, well, I don't believe in unearned income. I went, how many of you own shares? And the whole fucking room went silent. So you own the means of production and that means of production gives you money for nothing. You do nothing. You do no labor. You do no thinking for it. You don't write anything down. Mm -hmm. You do not observe. You do not have meetings about it. Yet that money just rolls in. And they all went fucking quiet. 
Nah. When we started talking about student <laughs> yeah, debt and stuff like there. that, and loans and stuff, and you're really going to have to sort that shit out. Yeah. And then this one kid who was filming it for his media studies course said, I don't mind paying for my education. And I just, he said, how else will it be paid? And I just swiveled my head round and just said, the same way we've always paid it. They're called taxes. <laughs> Again, Vi, how much was the ticket? Because oh, the I ticket. will pay, PayPal you the money for you to show up there every week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking, I will literally do that. <laughs> Imagine, uh, I'm actually being sponsored on Patreon and PayPal to sort of uh, set up this video camera. Mm. Really? Yes. Yes. Because you're going to say something that's going to piss me right off and my people love this and they're paying for me to come. <laughs> I get more for this than a whole TV show I do. I get like $50,000 $50, a, a month to come in here and tear you people apart. Yes, here's my fiver. <laughs> Go, impress me, say something stupid, I'd fucking dare you. And then I started telling them about artificial intelligence and robot robot cars, and they were like, yes. And all they could see is like blue collar workers, and I said, replacing things like lawyers and doctors. Mm. On an adv advisory level, if you do a job where you advise someone how to do something, or you advise someone based on their situation, financially or legally or in any way, as an advocate and stuff like that, your fucking time has come. Because not Should only be. will this AI tell me what the problem is, what mm. the answer is mm. to my problem, but it will also automatically fill in all the forms based on my responses. So lawyers and shit and people that give you advice or process stuff for you are obsolete. As of now, they're obsolete. They just don't know it yet. You know, Watson as an IBM thing and Siri and things like that are not widely available enough yet. That technology, as soon as that gets licensed out to law firms, to advocacy firms and shit like that, oh man, <laughs> those people are fired. And they basically looked at me and freaked out. We really upset them. Then I upset them some more by saying, we must do this again. <laughs> again, I will PayPal you the money to go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man somebody tried to tell me that uh, <laughs> oh, I was a, I was another room full of of people who thought they were smarter than they are yeah I they mean knew everything about a subject that they clearly I'll, I'll pay a pound on about when they were money to go, London to go very places now fashionable and, part mm, of London you know Fuck up and the status people ran quo, around that's smashing up me. things that were, gent were symbols of gentr <laughs> gentrification. So, like you know, um, quinoa bars and you know, bar uh, restaurants where you eat breakfast cereal, ironically, instead of other food. And this guy was saying, "Well, why? I don't see why they had to smash it up." I said, "They ha absolutely had to smash it up." I would have smashed it up. He said, well, that's destruction of property. It's destruction of property that are making it so that me and my children can never afford to live here ever again because none of us will be able to afford a rent or a house because you fuckers have just moved in and made it fashionable. So you have priced my children and grandchildren out of ever living here because it will take at least three generations for it to go down the toilet, even if you left now. Good point. That, that's one thing that's always upset me is because <clears throat> like all these these problems, you know, with with housing, with people going without housing, squatting, and I'm and I'm speaking as somebody who's squatted in a house for about a year. Um we you know it it wasn't some random abandoned house we didn't know the people involved but i mean regardless uh like <clears throat> all these all these places you know all these places that people have been evicted from that are that are empty or places that are abandoned you know should be put to use by people who who need housing they they want to go someplace they want to set up a squat I, I think they should perfectly be able to do so um you know 
and the whole thing about uh, city codes and things like that, the reason why that those types of things are are anti-poor people is because usually back in the day we would solve this problem by people just building their own houses out of materials that they found and refuse and, and so forth, building shanty towns and things like that. And at least they would have some form of housing. Uh, you know, it wasn't great housing, obviously. It might have been dangerous, but they were willing to take the risk to do that. And they were, you know, able to lift themselves out of poverty. Yeah. But now, you know, what you can't me off have that. that. There are buildings you can't that do that on your own. It's illegal. You'll get thrown in jail. Fine. You'll get shipped you off to another everything. There are guards city there if yours is not a homeless shelter, and you'll be put on the, the homeless person circuit instead of being able to provide for yourself. Like one or two people to live there. And we're talking, and I'm not talking about small houses. I'm talking about massive apartment flats. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If you if you opened up every unoccupied apartment in London to the homeless, not only could you house London's homeless, but you could also house the homeless of probably the rest of the country. You know, which is amazing. You know, there's that much housing. Or just let people live London, there for free. It's, an investment. I mean, it's not going to The value of, of, of property in London is sky high, and it only ever goes up. So there are companies yeah, buying so it rather than having money invested in banks because you pay, you know, as in they'd rather buy real <clears> estate somewhere where the property market's only going to ever increase than leave it in a bank at like 2% because they know they're going to make way, way more just investing in, say, a flat, an apartment somewhere like Chelsea. And they can sit on that and it will go up in value and on their book price and they'll be able to include it in their, in their managed assets portfolio and it'll appear on their bottom line for their shareholders. That's the awful thing about public limited companies or incorporated companies, is that they become, there isn't a person that's making these decisions. When there is a person, it's easy to hate them directly. Like that bloke who jacked up the price of AIDS medication, like 1500%. Because he could. Not because it had become expensive to make, it's dirt cheap. I mean, me and Digital Whiskey were looking at it. You can buy that drug for like three or four euros in the UK. Hang on, what's that stuff called again? Is it Di Diaprim or something like that? Yikes. I'll go look up the price because I want to be accurate on this stuff. But it is a pretty cheap uh... medicine as they go. You know, it's slightly more you expensive. Know, the annoying than... thing is that in Europe it's really cheap. Yeah. And, in, uh, and in America it's like stupid expensive. I'm like really thinking about just shipping over boxes of the stuff over there. And not doing it to make money. Yeah. Just sell it absolutely at cost and, p and packing. And just let that machine run. And make zero, a lot zero of profit. They can send them. Yeah. The annoying thing is that it's probably illegal. Yeah. Oh yeah. You get sued into the Stone Age. But, yeah, it, but I think I mentioned this the last time. But, uh, and all you've got is a board that reports to the shareholders. The board have got to make the best decision for the shareholders. So morality goes out the window very quickly. Whereas if it's a person that is, owns the company, you know, when they do something despicable, they're roundly hounded about it being despicable. Like that horrific human being that bought out um, BHS. Something green. And then just, just took out all the money from the pension fund and some of the, some people have been working there 40 years and just decimated the pension fund <sighs> peter green that's it think, yet another Sir peter green reason still. to abolish corporations as we've talked about Euros for 30 tablets 25 milligrams for a box of dimethyl but it's yeah that's just stupid cheap. I'm surprised that the illegal drug trafficking circuit hasn't picked this up. Can you imagine Ooh, that? That's, More money that's cool. by selling you know, legal uh, medicine than illegal drugs. Of, or, you know, 
stuff that makes you go high instead of heals you from diseases. Good point. I don't know. Dis despite the deficit in the pension def in the pension fund of five hundred and seventy one million, it probably is happening. Yeah? It's just not being reported. Um, Green and his family collected five hundred and eighty six million guess. in dividends, rental payments, and interest <clears> on loans <throat> during their fifteen year ownership. Um, they literally took all the money out of that firm and left the pension. The people that had earned a pension. Yeah. Yeah, pensions don't aren't gonna exist anymore. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's gonna probably oh, yeah, gonna I'm exist by then, but it's any of that is gonna, gonna be exist useless by the time I need to retire. Yeah, it's gonna be so little money by the time for you get for there. anybody, and they will weasel out it's of every last gone. possible in the United penny. States. Uh, We're gonna. Work yeah, I'm. Bit. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just going to become Mr. Uber Bushcraft and scal scavenger and salvager. I'm going to dumpster dive. I'm going to hunt my own meat. I'm going to go fucking crazy. Yeah. I'm going to grow and my own veg and all that sort of shit. It would just be like, no. <clears throat> just, uh, I'll have solar panels on the roof of wherever I'm living. No, we're not playing. That's why I don't put any money in it. And you're going to be taxed for that. Yeah, probably. That's. I mean, right now, um, for solar panels. Right now we have laws in the books that say that if you build a new house or renovate an old one, you need to have a certain percentage of renewable energy, which is completely fine, logical and reasonable. Except now they're putting in taxes that if you hook that up to the, to the grid, you're going to have to pay extra taxes. That's the thing though, I wouldn't hook it up to the grid. Doesn't matter. Oh, we do, we flew a drone over your house. You have this many square feet of solar panels. This means that you produce that much electricity. So you owe us this many, this many, this much money in taxes. Pay up so now, they, or we'll they, send they, them they, the police. They actually own. They actually own the sunlight that falls on your house. No, no. You have to pay taxes to maintain the infrastructure above. Yeah, uh, but, that's but, the national grid. I know it's stupid, but that's the excuse. Oh no! If it's part, if it's part of the grid, what I'm saying is, if you go completely off grid and you have them cut off your electricity supply, well, just say, that no, doesn't even make sense. Because of reasons, the main maintenance of the grid is actually <laughs> right. quite cheap. Because you know, it's all uh, it's all there. It's solid state. Yeah, it's all there. It's it's all it's solid all insulated state. to fuck. Yep. They, you know, they plan uh, for it. You know, the the cables. You know, the main cables that transfer from power station to substations are fucking huge. Yep. You know, maybe in but a thousand years. The main years. cost is to pay the board of directors yeah. and the politicians that are involved, etc., etc. That's what you're paying. You're not actually paying for stuff. You're paying for people yeah. that actually that aren't actually doing anything. In the last, that's how it used to be here. It, th in the beginning, well, uh, th that's in mental the to me because in the last ten like years really or so, expensive you know, in the United they States, they've been, they've been actually selling back to, uh, the electricity that they make for every from the solar panels back to the power companies, so they actually get a are making money. money. And what? in the beginning, this how, was how did they quite reverse a lot that? because, of course, solar panels and all the installation was very expensive. Yeah. They kept this along for way too long, to the point where that I know a couple small businesses, what they did was they simply f filled all their rooftops and all square footage by solar panels, and now they just, they're not a business anymore. They make their money by having solar panels on their roof. Wow. And all plus all the subsidies. No, yeah, no, you you get subsidies for you you you're paid for the electricity that you put on the grid more than you should uh, than than the power company can actually give you. It's from but, the state. I mean, it's now, not it's not even a subsidy that, course, though. This it's not a subsidy if you're, paying, you're, you're not if you're paying them back. Politician by abolishing the system, so they're left with a massive amount of uh, people that they need to pay and yeah. who needs to pay this. People who couldn't oh. afford it back in the day to put in the solar oh. panels. 
how did you do that by taxing you you know basically just saying oh you put in this much energy energy into the grid therefore you need to pay this much taxes oh so so they tax part of your income from the grid when they pay you uh no they don't pay you at all wow. like there are people that are paid by the subsidies because that's the old system if you do right now so you're in the new system you have to pay money to put it on the grid you don't get yeah, anything but they're off the bank. my my plan yes. would be yeah yes exactly that does not make any sense yeah the reason why they do they do it because they fucked it up in the, in the past and they need to pay those people that are still uh, in the old system yeah but yeah. you're generating electricity See, I, I, I for them. They don't have to do it. That doesn't make any sense. Just be like, completely disconnect me from electricity. I'll just generate my own. Yeah, and Thanks. that's when you run into bu bureaucracy, which they they fly a drone over your house. Oh, you have this many solar panels. You didn't declare them on their t on your on your taxes. You yeah, but what if you're not, much not connected money, to the national happen. grid? What if you're not even connected yeah. to it? Yeah, how long you think it's gonna take you until you can yeah, prove that, and then then they accept this? Well, I think I mean, it'd be fairly obvious. It'd yeah, it should be fairly probably obvious. Disconnected. But... You just have yeah. them come and cap off your your meter and just mm -hmm. say, "Look, I don't want your product." I yeah. mean, that's it's kind of how I. I mean, the, the the weird thing, like with TV licenses in the in the UK. Initially, the only people making television yeah, really. were the BBC. So they needed a functioning, you know, sort of amount of money so that they could make television yeah. programs. And when it was just the BBC and maybe one other independent television channel, that kind of made sense. You're paying for the programs to be made, which meant that there were no, there was no advertising on BBC. But now there's like 400 channels. They still expect you to pay all of that money to the BBC. And no money goes to any of the other channels. <laughs> And so you end up subsidising the BBC if you have a television, even if you don't watch BBC programming. And they even tried to pull a scam where they said, right, if you own a laptop and you've got the ability to watch some BBC content, you still have to pay a licence. And then they, they realised that was totally... Yeah, that's totally... Well, they realised that was totally illegal, so then they amended it yeah, and said, we're going to send round detector vans. And if we detect that you're downloading packets from the BBC server, you're going to have to pay a TV license or a fine. That isn't that in violation well, of privacy? Well, card or something? With, even with <laughs> the UK privacy laws, that's totally illegal and not even feasible. You could don't have the kind of direction finding equipment oh, to trace a packet going to a particular laptop in a particular building or a particular part of a building. What a waste of money. There's just no way you can do it. So not without tapping basically everybody's internet and then flagging you if you if you look at a BBC website. It's just not possible. Um, and they made out they were sending around Wi-Fi detector vans and everybody... Just, the first thing that happened is that... So I think some one of the reporters on the BBC actually said, that's not actually possible. You know, we know it's not possible. Everybody knows it's not possible. <clears throat> and back in, back in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, they claimed to have television detector vans patrolling and if they thought someone was using a TV and they didn't have a TV license, they'd try and take him to court. But not one of those. Nobody was ever taken mm -hmm. to court because you can't detect in a block of flats whether there's another television in a flat that doesn't have, you know, any <laughs> that doesn't have a television in it or doesn't have a license. It was not. It was never possible for them to do it. And they got found out, and they looked like such chumps. It was just like it was just like really using like propaganda to make you buy a t you know obviously using propaganda to try and make you buy a TV license, and they're not even allowed to come in your house unless you invite them. So even they could send someone to your house and say, "Can I come in and have a look, see if there's a television?" And if you say no, they can't do anything about it. That would be a fun thing to put on a resume. Yeah, I drove around in a van for five years looking for something that we cannot possibly detect. Yeah. And I but got I'm, paid for it. Yeah. What a job. Hey. If I was ever going to, going to go around someone's house. Yeah, um, never, never. I'd have a little card in. with me if I was working for them that said, I am a TV detector, t TV license inspector. You do not have to enter me into my house. The only way I can look around your house is if you say <laughs> that I can come in. If you say I can't come in, I can't come in. And hand that to them without saying anything. I go, hi, I'm from the TV licensing authority. 
It's just like in really big letters, like postcard, you know, 40 point letters. I cannot come in unless you invite me in. I have no warrant. There is no, no legal precedent. You don't have to let me in. I can only look around if you say I can. And it's just like they phoned me up and mm-hmm. said, you don't have a TV license. I said, bang on, I don't have a television. You know, the BBC is producing ever worse product and I don't want to watch any of it. You know, if I desperately <clears> want to watch <throat> Doctor Who, I'll buy it on DVD. I'll wait till it appears at one of these, uh, you know, like a pawn shop or cash converters or something like that. And I'll just buy it for like a fiver in a few years time. No, none of your stuff's worth it. I'm not paying you £130 to watch maybe an hour's worth of content a year. No. I mean, I could get a hooker for that kind of money. I could buy, like, a large amount of cocaine. I could buy an ounce of marijuana. You know, I could I could really have some fun over many, many, many hours being off my box watching Sesame Street or some shit rather than watch your shite for the tiny amount. Hmm. But, yeah. Pagdu, speak. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, fair enough. Sorry, I'm just having a rant. I'm jumping in here. I'm jumping in here. I'm taking the floor, if you guys don't mind, for a little while. Uh, it's okay. Um, the only the only reason I, I'm prefacing it like that is because if I get interrupted too many times, I'm going to forget what the fuck I'm saying. So, anyways. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, we... Oh. Oh, yeah. Obviously, the Rangers YouTube, have the YouTube channel. We've been posting stuff up on there. On um, and our and stuff is a bit more slow burn. Uh, like so we like probably get years, more to listeners years. or new listeners than. And that's fine. Um, it's, it's, it's we've had kind of like in the past. Going out I know we've got a lot of the, the old school kind of fans. Some people stumble on it, not necessarily this week or even this month. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 But anyway, I know I know we've got a lot of the uh the older listeners coming back in the R scene lately. So that's cool. Obviously, you know, we came we came back from our uh from our long period of silence, or at least I did. Um so, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do is kind of give, um, a context for the, some of the things I was yeah. saying in the last few episodes, if you haven't been following us and Rangers for, for a long time, uh, you might not know some of this stuff. I mean, we've been doing this show while well, UV started it over, over 10 years ago, correct? I mean, <laughs> to give you guys some context, like when when we started doing this, um, blog was a new word. Uh, there were no smartphones, or they were. I mean, there were still like people were running around with PDAs and stuff like that. Um, I mean, uh, YouTube had a ten minute limit, so that's why I wasn't uploading anything to li- uh, to YouTube. Um, we. We've been doing this for a really long time, and I'm sure there's lots of other examples that I can I can throw out there. I mean, the oil PC was still a thing, you know, uh, lots of stuff like that. We've been doing this for a really, really long time, and um, <clears throat> we we uh, by all accounts should be you know massively wealthy if if we were hawking products or. Uh, accepting donations or, or something like that, uh, as we've seen other people in the alternative media um, rise to prominence in the same amount of time. But, you know, we're, we're giving everything away for free. Um, I've, uh, I've offered to start donating. Um, I'm perfectly willing to do that. Yeah, that's uh, right. yeah. And, you know, if you guys aren't... I'd like to, I'd like to gauge... You know, the interest on that, you know, forgive me, V, if I'm overstepping my bounds here, but I'd, I'd like 
people to kind of chime in on whether they're willing to do that or, or interested in doing that. Um, <clears throat> anyways, um, it's, uh, it, it wouldn't be going to me anyway. It would be going to V, the main producer, and he can, you know, distribute as, as necessary if there's certain projects that people are interested in funding. Um, but anyways, uh, the, <laughs> some of the context for what I was saying, um, I, as, as some people don't know, um, back in the day, we, we talked a lot about anarchy and, um, my, my brand of anarchy is the, is the libertarian free market anarchist. And at the time I was also had, you know, agorist tendencies and things like that. And now I'm moving more towards the, um, kind of the Vanu strategy put out by El Rio, um, simply because I'm, I'm not interested in, you know, trying to change the world or the country or anything else like that anymore. I'm not interested in converting people. I'm just interested in living as free as I can and, um, and having other people, uh, live as, you know, showing other people how to do it too. So that people that are interested in freedom can figure out how to do it for themselves. And, um, <clears throat> so that is yeah, kind I mean, of the it was, it was ultimate if, goal if a bit that I have. I mean, I that would I think have liked V has. Of it. Um, In hindsight, I could have, you know, and and V was a lot better. Was lot doing earlier. that for you know, for quite a long time, living it. in the teepee and stuff like that. I mean, um, feel free to speak to that if but, you want. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's felt I felt the same way when I was living out of my truck. I was like, why didn't I do this, you know, years ago? I mean, I could have saved a boatload of money. Anyways, uh, and, I, and I probably would, well, hmm. if I hadn't lost all that money, I probably wouldn't be where I am right now because I wouldn't have moved. I would have stayed where I was, but eh, regardless, um, um, my life has, has changed. Uh, a little bit, but, um, but anyway, uh, if you've, if you've watched, um, uh, what the fuck is his name? Um, Adam Curtis's, uh, Century of the Self, there's an interview with some, some yippies in there, and they were talking about how, um, the, this, this, psychological techniques and, and training that they went through, uh, specifically S training, um, made them a little bit, uh, less moved by, by injustice as, um, as they previously were. And I guess that's where I'm sitting right now, just because of the experience that I've had in the last, you know, six years or so. I'm, I'm kind of less moved by injustice as I was before. So I'm not as radical as I was back then. I mean, I, I also did not have a family to provide for. So I mean, <laughs> the, the single young men out there in yeah, that are it's, it's in Rangers harder. and listening to Rangers. It's not impossible. I mean, it is a lot harder. do all the extreme, you know, austere living now while you still can uh <laughs> because you know when you have a family you're gonna you're gonna think twice about it <clears throat> but <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so um the it's, a lot a lot of what i do now you know revolves around protecting protecting my family and, um, you know, I've people, um, that know me, I don't want to, again, I don't want to reveal too much information, but, um, you know, people that know me, uh, know what field I work in now and, you know, would say that, 
you know, that I'm a hypocrite but for, I think, I think you know, if you don't espousing ex- if you to be an anarchist and then, and then implied you know, authority. choosing this as my I think field that of you're employment. automatically an anarchist. And uh, those people that, are, that, that want to do that, that um, can just I think that's, one that's a fair criticism. What to do I'll take that. That would have been the worst thing for me. The uh, moment you realize that that's kind of morally mm. wrong, unless it's acting for the good of the group, if it genuinely is. Yeah. I, th- yeah. I think, you know, if you question authority, then by nature you're an anarchist, because if you question it, that means you don't give it automatically every single time. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, I mean I'm mean, i I'm I'm British, you know, if I meet the royal family... Yeah, I, I'll agree if, with if that. If somebody was going to say, for some reason I'm, I'm in a position where I get to meet the royal family, actually, as in genuinely meet them. You know, and what the royal, what the what the royal yeah. equerries do is they come round and see if you'll be okay with it. Genuinely, even if you're at like a royal variety performance, say you had a hit song, and at the end of the performance you're all introduced to the royal family who sit in a box and watch the whole thing. When they say, "Are you okay with meeting the queen?" and if you, if mm-hmm. I were to say, "Do you mean I have to bow?" or you know call her your majesty and they go well yeah that kind of thing and if you say no they take you out of the lineup to avoid embarrassment well, if you win an award like an OBE or a knighthood they get in touch with you first to ask if you would be okay receiving a knighthood you know rather than because I don't I think you know I wonder how many are turned down yeah. because if, if it was the sort of thing you got dragged into doing and they make you turn up and you give it back <laughs> they're going to be all kinds of embarrassed it's like no I don't want it mm-hmm. and I, I don't want it to the point where I don't want it and I will be, I will not want it on television if you make me I yeah I mean if I if I met one of them would I have to refer to them <laughs> as Mr or Mrs Windsor so, I'm sorry I don't believe in you as an idea you know the idea that there is this one perfect family <clears throat> who we all watch. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, are you no. going to show deference? I don't to, care. I don't to wish. I don't wish them any harm. I do know there's a good economic reason for having them, <laughs> because they own tons and tons of land. <clears throat> and if we ever cut them off from the civil list and don't call them the king and queen, they'll get the proper rent that all those government buildings are on on their land. Yeah, and it will cost the government, you know, twenty <clears throat> times more than it pays now in rent. It would it would ruin the government for them not to be the royal family, in a sense, unless they radically changed all the rules. They'd have to unpick so much <coughs> basic legal system stuff. They'd have to almost rewrite English law in order to get round having to pay them. Yeah, well, the point I mean, the point I was like getting places at. like Admiralty Arch and the, the Palace of Westminster are on royal right. land, for which they pay a peppercorn rent. They don't own the land that those buildings are on. So you know, the the entire government would have to move to Milton Keynes or somewhere. Yeah. Sorry. Hmm. I'm just, that's surprising they can enforce anything if they don't own the property. But anyways, um. The uh, the point I was getting at the the reason why I mentioned my that's okay the reason why I mentioned um, you know that was you know if if I could I live in a very small town and if I could um, you know get into something that was producing about the same amount of money um, I probably would I mean, and you know there wouldn't be this contradiction in terms here but um, I. Uh, the 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 point I was uh, I'm trying to make is that that everything now and then even you know revolves around protecting and, and, and defending uh, myself and my loved ones and my property and that's the kind of framework that I want to I want to put this in you know whether it's um, <clears throat> protecting the life of myself or my wife or um, whether it's uh, securing our where we live, or our our block, our neighborhood, um, or even you know I I know the local sheriff. Um, we in a roundabout way supported him um, and the under sheriff, 
and you know if they were to uh, seem necessary to you know if I if I saw one of these you know crimes happening of uh, you know armed robbery or something like that or one of these mass shootings and you know I thought that I could show up and help and do something about it hmm. um, without you know risking harm to myself by the police not by the shooter but just by the police um, and I and and they accepted yeah. my help and I could be deputized or whatever I, I would um, and so that's that's kind of the context in which I am talking about weapons and things like that um, I'm not I'm not talking about weapons in in an offensive um, manner um, but that's the context in which I've, I've been talking about that stuff and I just wanted people to know that um, the <clears throat> like and and the reason why I talked about the whole masking thing in the last International Rangers um, the reason why I talked about that is because it's you know increasingly uncomfortable for everybody um, to talk about weapons and, and may and someday become, you know, illegal. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the things that are happening right now kind of echo, uh, the way, the same way I was feeling back in the days when, um, Bush was president and, you know, uh, NSA spy and all that kind of stuff was, you know, the biggest thing in the news. Um, and, and, people were no, i think it's, it's you know genuinely like you were talking about about afraid to um, to bre sort of to breach certain topics insulating yourself as because, much as possible you know they'd be from you know branded terrorist an and i don't i don't think that's, that's what rangers is about life. um you know whether that's suddenly becoming unemployed or suddenly becoming homeless or insurrection or fucking zombie apocalypse you know yes. having a plan is is it like a really good idea having like at least a flexible yeah. plan where you think if shit goes um, down i'm good for a for a week even if i've got nowhere to go i've got no communications everything turns to fucking yes chaos. i've got enough stuff to actually barricade me and people i know close to me in and feed them and keep them safe at a very minimum like when all hell breaks loose and there's nothing you can do about it usefully Yes. And I'm and I'm glad that you brought up that some of those points um, because one of these things and and this is I'm going to rehash this again briefly, but um, the the whole uh, my conversation with uh, Molyneux and his and his converts was that you know if if you push this far enough if you actually live what you believe right now and you go off and and uh, try to maintain autonomy from the current society um, eventually you will be attacked I mean whether it's um, you know not for not paying taxes for not you know, registering and licensing your car from, uh, from, yeah. you know, homeschooling your children, like whatever it is, you know, like eventually the state is going to come after you. And, you know, at, the question then becomes at, at what point do you defend yourself? And so I'm not, I'm not condoning or, or suggesting any kind of specific action. Oh, yeah. But I'm, I'm I mean, saying that they, the thing, they will though, come it? after as you. As soon as you do it, and they you, will you basically stop. They will try to arrest you. you They'll try to burn your house down. They'll try to shoot you. I mean, 
If you push it far enough, they the will be on the offensive. Into. And you'll be on the, the problem defensive. problem with that is that you'll probably be quite happy. And the second other people see that you can be happy and fulfilled and not be bothered by this way or inter have your lives interfered with, lots of other people are going to try and do the same thing. If word gets out that you're quite happy and you're doing it, even if it's for religion, re religious reasons, loads of other people will join in. And then the government suddenly finds itself completely superfluous. Because it is superfluous. Yeah. And and that's why that's why unfortunately I can't I can't say that you know no one no one from from rangers would ever tell you not to ever break any laws because I mean that's that's kind of an an impossible task. You know, I would say I would say live you know, live morally, live righteously. Um, you know, be be just in your in your actions. You know, uh, but it would be a case be, of we will not initiate don't be, violence. Uh, if, don't if initiate violence. Two, you know, the whole non-aggression principle thing that we used to talk about back in the day. Play. It will not. You know, be <clears throat> sort of um, just punch a few people. So it will be we will be fighting for um, our lives because that's what how we'll consider that, it. We'll consider it as an act of war from one nation to another. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. that's how you'd have to be. You'd have to be, I'm really sorry about this. But it doesn't seem to be any reason that a government will accept. If you try and, essentially what you're doing is seceding from society. Exactly. And it's a little bit like the whole of Western society is shopping yeah. at the corner store yeah. for everything. You know, they're paying top retail rate just because it's convenient, because it's at the end of the street for everything. They right. buy their car from the corner store. They buy their electricity from the corner store. They buy their road access and education and basic services and, and all that sort of thing. Absolutely everything from the corner store. And it's a bit like showing your neighbor where yep. the Costco is. And just saying, look, you could just do this. This is much sensible, more sensible. It requires you to have a little bit of intelligence and you to think about what you're doing. But it is like incredibly way cheaper. And that's what we're trying mm -hmm. to teach humanity. We're teach, trying to teach humanity to buy baked beans by the case rather than buy them a can at a time. And that's what you're doing with government, really. You're, you're paying well over the odds for less product mm -hmm. than you would. You know, and if you look at some of the things that get crowdfunded, crowdfunding is a really good yeah. idea, uh, example of almost anarchy at work, market anarchy. If you say, I'm going to make this, would anybody like one? It will cost this. The minimum I can make is 500. It will cost this if we all pay in to have them manufactured. Plus a little bit for me for having come up with a cool idea. And if it's a good idea, people will yeah. fucking pay out the yin yang. Oh, it yeah, the and that it kind of brings up the whole um, insurrection topic too, <coughs> to some extent, because um, if every if if on a well, mass already scale, trying to make Bitcoin everybody sound started suspect. using these cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, you know, they're already Bitcoin linking it with and terrorism like, and organized crime and shit. Yeah, and and eventually they'll they'll try to outlaw it. They'll try to you know ostracize people, criminalize people. Yeah. That that are, yeah, they're trying to they're trying to to separate the the users, um, you know, from from the normal society, but but making them a criminal element, um, and but it's like the cryptocurrency is the ultimate peaceful weapon because if everybody used that. No. You could you could transform a society, transform an, an economy, a nation, you know, overnight uh, without any bloodshed. Oh, um, but the problem is, is, is they're not going to let a bunch this of people happen. Voted not to be part of Spain. And, Spain sent in and troops, they're going to eventually get violent about you it. Know, they sent in the police and to that's, people up that's for voting. And that's kind of where the I mean, 
This was the a vote that didn't really in. even have any political and weight, necessarily. It was just a referendum right. for the people of Catalonia to vote on whether they should leave Spain. Yeah. And they sent in people to beat up people that were trying to vote, literally. <laughs> that's not insane. Even, not even pretended that there was something else going on. They literally, yeah. That's exactly what they did. That's an EU country. That's, you know, that's 300 miles away from me. <laughs> and they went and did that. I, categori yeah, I, I, think I categorically uh, support there is, there secession. Is the, the very dark side. Um, so the flip side any, anybody who wants the, to succeed from anybody um, else for any reason, Russia, you know, freedom of association, kind of on a, on a national scale, I, I support. So, so if Russia manages to hang in there as a major, massively big country, and it keeps encouraging and pushing all the the news channels and the social media channels about secession then all you'll have hmm. in Europe and the people that will initially have to oppose Russia in any kind of land war, all these countries will be so tiny that they won't really have much of an armed forces. Which is kind of what they did after the Second World War in the guise of sending in security troops. They sent in communist agitators or, or Stalinist agitators to sort of like cause you know disruption and stuff like that russia claimed to the un yeah for its own security it had to move in and quell this uprising and then all of a sudden they've got all the balkan states they've got poland they've got czechoslovakia they've you know they're you know looking in on east germany and that's what they did you know and that's what they're i think they're trying to do again they're trying to break up europe into small enough countries where they can just take over a little teeny tiny country and no one will say anything well that's weird it's weird because yeah i mean you know that sort of red menace is coming back only this time it's much worse they're capitalists at least there was yeah they, of communist well ideology. they're like they're encouraging secession for it the outside about, but you know, in, you know from the inside they're hoovering up like all that. these other this territories time they're capitalists. that's kind of weird they're oligarchs they're the people that want you know the the polish oil yeah. pipeline they're the people that want you know all those little um, Uzbekistan and places like that because they keep discovering useful minerals there that are used for smartphones or some shit like yeah. that they'll find a natural resource and just literally hollow out that country for that natural resource it's a little bit like what China is doing with mega mining corporations in Africa right now when it properly is happening I mean you can, you can look at it any way you like but you have to say the world is a fairly unstable place and weird, th weird, th weird shit is afoot uh, and not be paranoid. I mean, not not even start talking about lizard people or an Illuminati or a ruling class. Just look at what corporations will do if left unchecked. Yeah, it's, just look at what mega millionaires are going to do. It's officially, yeah, and they will do that. And it's just one person making that choice. Mm -hmm. It's one greedy mm -hmm. person decides that they're going to have that. Yeah, and. It If you look at, if you look at all the, or any nation, yeah, I mean, any anybody that says right, we are if now. If you look a at all the from here until that mountain, range, the first world nation, nation, and I get to decide what happens. They're all, or I'll give fascist, you a couple of very limited choices economically. That aren't really choices at all, and we'll pretend we're a democracy. Yeah, I, th I think the only place where you, yeah, where you can't do it, the only the only country I've seen where you can't do it very easily. Well, that's is Iceland. yeah, that's kind of more of the and Iceland authoritarian because mindset. They can mobilize more than even, half the even talking about an economy. That's just time. by because fiat. Most of them just saying, most of them are I own this. Pretty politically well read. They've got really good education, really good media, and mm -hmm. when somebody tries to pull a fast one, they're gone. Not only are they gone, not only are they out of office, they're sometimes in prison. You know, occasionally, if you fuck up in Iceland too bad, and th the people get wind of it, half of them will turn up and demand you fucking change it and, and demand your resignation. They'll literally walk up to the par parliamentary steps mm -hmm. in Reykjavik and tell you to get lost. You know, 
Mm-hmm. It's really heavy um, in the microphone, yeah, isn't it? Not to detract I've a little bit. I've been stopping but, breathing because um, I was it, worried it was me. It and is, it's like, uh, no, it's not me. DW over there, he's, <laughs> he like... Is it me? Breathing my heartbeat. Hang on. What? It sharpens its knife. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, right. I, I feel like I'm seriously okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm in outside a. I feel like I'm in a room or something. Yeah, <laughs> haven't they just, told you? Just in this really serious, <laughs> this really serious sort of like dialogue, you know, going on about how the world is doomed in terrible places. <sighs> oh, come on, man. Turn to the dark the side. Show. Telling me you are now a crypto fascist. Never. <laughs> I find your lack of faith disturbing. Is better now? Digital whiskey is our father. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was a tension breaker. We needed that. Oh wow. Well. I thought of some really. I've, I've, I thought of a mad invention, and, and I'd like some feedback on this. Okay. Even if you don't want to do a Patreon thing for Rangers, how about this? A set of playing cards. Yeah. They're like normal playing cards. You're going to hear poker like a with whale song like that, coming up pretty soon. Because on every single one is a different um, either end of the world scenario or post apocalyptic um, discussion problem. So, like, you have a sort of a pandemic hits, you know, you're not sure if you're immune to said disease or whether you've had it or not. Do you let people into your house? And if so, what are your criteria? You know, uh, like, uh, as a little passage on each card, yeah. you know, like they sometimes have playing cards with Bible verses on it. On each of the 50, on each of the 54, including the Jokers, playing cards, there's a different mad post apocalyptic or apocalyptic mm -hmm. question. As a discussion thing, as in, if you're sitting around and you're... Yeah. Yeah, like wide-spectrum survival. You know, really complicated problems. What do you do? In this situation, what Please do you do? Please don't call it survival. Okay. I yeah, mean, I think... Like uh, uh, Full-spectrum like survival. Then, uh, survival is immediately... immediately like yeah, yeah you're, me. you're immediately useless. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Yeah. A, um, a maintenance of your... Um, social... Lifestyle. In, in the event of, you know, how do you, how do you keep everybody safe? How do you, you know, what do you do in this situation? Like, situ you know, emergency situation, shall we say, and what you'll do. On every single playing card, there's a different one. And then if you're at, if you're at a meet, you can just shuffle through the cards and pick out one at random if you haven't got anything to talk about. Which also serves a function. If you've already discussed what you plan to do even if you're even if you're not with the people you discussed it with you'll have got a whole bunch of viewpoints and some good ideas as to how to solve a particular problem so if anything even remotely like that crops up in your life you've already got a little bit of a plan and just just kind of thinking about it and understanding what you might do in a given situation will make it easier should you ever face that situation It's, it's hypothetical, but I was going to run up a um, a uh, a sort of a prototype copy. Do we have facilities to print this and just stuff right now? Run or some paper through a laminator, cut out a bunch of cards. Point. You know, with a with a full deck of playing cards, and then just sort of like see if I could come up before I print it. Obviously, can see if I can come up with fifty two different in situations. Okay. Like and have situational um, planning cards, if you like. Okay. So, you know, what are your priorities? How do you solve it? But, you know, and it's a set of playing cards. It's the sort of thing that you'll, you tuck into your pack anyway. Sure. Because they're just astoundingly useful for keeping you occupied and, you know, yeah. break, you know having conversations with people. But you could have I these like instead. The idea. You say, okay, you know, if, you, if, if you're new to them, the next time you go camping or something like that, you just, you'll like mm -hmm. this. Let's get these out. But if I now feel like I need to do research on what happened in the uh, latest, uh, what's the pen, uh, epidemic in Africa, or oh, what's the disease called? Ebola. Yeah. yeah. What people did there. But if you, you know, if you if you'd cycle through that, and you went through them, 
you've got this wide wide ranging pre plan sort of seeds of plans in your head that then mm. if something happens it, you'd just be immediately reminded of that discussion you had it's like right okay so we need to do this really to be absolutely you know because a lot of the, i think a lot of the problems people have is the shock of the new situation that's, yep. where, that's where it falls over whereas if it wasn't particularly a new situation but it was looking on the faces of everybody around that this was a new situation to them at least one person would be able to break the the, the deadlock of silence and go right okay what we need to do is this i think it'd be like almost like tactical planning because those plans in your head are the most useful thing you have the most useful thing you cart around the kit's nice to have but we all kind of know we could probably make some sort yep. of cutting item out of something we found in a piece of forest or from a piece of jagged metal or a we know we know that a knife was well important mm -hmm. and we know what what constitutes a knife so even if we're using a piece of broken glass we're at least you know we're 30 seconds from being armed you know you know that the first thing you do is see if you could smash a bottle or something like that and just like right yeah. I'm, I'm not even gonna, i'm not going to worry about being armed if something happens this is one of those situations i need to arm myself yeah you know that sort of thing this is one of those situations where i need shelter and i know roughly how what constitutes shelter and i know how to turn up what i can see around me into that that's always more useful than the best knife in the world the best axe because if you've yeah, never used that best axe yeah. in the world you're still going to be a bit fucked if you need suddenly need to build a shelter And it's it's just one of those things. It's handier to have. The yeah, tools I mean, a lot of skill or a lot of shelters to go after that problem. Um, survival shelters can be built without any tools. And, and the mental side um, of same with you know uh, firework gathering and for lots and lots of different scenarios is always the most important bit. And I and yeah. I want to I want to stress that a lot more with you know what we do as rangers. You know where we even if we just people are just listening to us war gaming situations and then they have a better idea and they tell us is much much more useful than us doing unboxings you know it's way 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 more useful but it's unboxings that get all the big sort of like mm. two million subscribers and shit like that nobody really goes i mean yeah. except maybe dave canterbury but he's still quite kit oriented well and and sadly um you know yeah yeah hmm. well being unfortunately um, being physically fit has quite a bit to do with it too I mean escape no. evasion if you can uh, navigate and using just a map self rescue and getting out of that area where you are because it's unfamiliar I mean if you don't you have to stay there if you have because like, you know you can walk plan. out then you don't need to build a shelter but that doesn't, fire you know not all of it is ever going to remember so, you know if you know that you should get off the ground yeah. and get under shelter before you sleep in this environment yeah. because you know cold is one of the biggest killers and it will use up the calories that you do have far faster than anything else it's like 700 calories a night on sleeping on the ground if it's cold as in anywhere near freezing or below you know it's lethal if it's much more than 10 below and you're not insulated from it so just knowing that means that you you can prioritize yeah. real quick you know you sort of think yeah. well i can go to bed hungry or thirsty but i can't go to bed in this environment without being off the ground and sheltered from the wind you know how to prioritize and it... yeah you're throwing away yep. nearly a day's worth of food and if you and if you eat so you're gonna instead be tired, of you're gonna be cranky, and building a proper shelter or getting off the ground i mean that's you're just wasting your resources you know, the best place point. for uh, you know unless you're really well stocked for food the best place for even a meager amount of food is inside you doing its job but you've got to help that out and it, you know if it, i like, i want to discuss more of that sort of thing look, look you're and never going to have your choice of toys if an emergency does really happen unless it happens right outside your door Mm -hmm. You know, the things that are apt to for you to have to get past that are big are things that, 
you know, you're not necessarily going to have everything that you need to hand. But if mm -hmm. you're smart enough, you'll be able to figure it out. I mean, you, humans have been living in jungles and deserts and shit for thousands and thousands of years. You know, we, we properly did work out how to live in the environments we're in. Unless you're somewhere like, you know, northern Canada or somewhere like that where people were never meant to live and nobody else lives there. And it only exists because there's a city there. But if it's in a, in, in a reasonable temperature range and outside isn't going to kill you every single day, then humans have evolved to live there. You know, so you need to get back into that. You need to, you, <laughs> But you've got the advantage of you know how to do an awful lot of stuff people know inherently you know just by being alive and having a bit of an understanding of history and reading a bit you can understand how roughly to make steel how to forge a, pe a piece of metal you can figure out how to start if you needed to making glass or setting a broken limb you don't have to find out through a process of elimination you know the stuff humanity has found out that's fairly simple to remember you know that if you leave a piece of bread to go mouldy it's essentially penicillin you know, you, you, can, you can push a piece of mouldy bread up against a wound and put a bandage over the top of it and you've probably got a much, much higher chance of survival if you than getting an infected wound. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know about bread mould, then you won't get gangrene. You know, it's that those, those things that took, you know, millennia to find out, you get to step right into and it's those things that we should concentrate yeah. more on what the best steel for a knife is. Or, you know, or which is the very, very best oh. axe that's better than a good axe. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've got a, an idea and an imagination. I think that's why there are so many nerdy people in Rangers. As opposed to, you don't see people like us, except in Rant and Rangers. And that's pretty much it. The rest of the survival community are guys that go to the range a lot or have 400 knives. <laughs> And I, I think that's more or less unique. I've never heard anybody going, look, you've got to think your way out of this sort of fucking problem. You know, and we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of all the nightmarish things that could occur that yeah. we wouldn't have plans for. <laughs> that we'd have no hope of thing. But the fact that we can plan for all sorts of other shit probably makes us a bit more flexible to adapt to this new situation. And it's those people, the people that adapt. Adaptability is always the best survival tool. Yeah, I mean it's it's just for the for the people who are, you know, plugged in and dependent on on computers and stuff like that and have trouble grasping this. I mean, it's just it's just keeping on going no matter what's happening. I mean, if your car breaks down, which I had to deal with, you know, if recently if if your computer fails, if you know your your water's turned off, if your power's off, if you know you lost your job, if anything, I mean, it's just figuring out how to carry on. And uh, I posted in the uh, in the mumble chat there um a a ghost town. This totally slipped my mind after the. Um, the last uh, conversation that we had the last uh, rangers radio but um kitsalt uh, bc is a completely abandoned town that was made in the 70s for uh, mining purposes in in british columbia um it's actually almost closer to alaska i guess is what they were saying um but uh, this place is completely abandoned. There was a guy who went there in 2016 and filmed some footage. Even though that town is technically owned by some guy in India. Um, obviously they're not trying to keep people out or enforce it. So um, as another stronghold of it depends uh, on rangers and monks and so forth. Although I think if you've we got should a whole go, town... You know, with a, you a squad of, of, sort of six, eight guys and just sort of take over the easy. whole town. Because I think it'd be very easy. <laughs> wow.
It's hard. It's still got power. Still got power running to it. And it has a hospital. It has so if a there's bank, a TV producer out there or a friendly mall, millionaire, uh, I mean, it's got almost now is the time. Everything that you would need. Seriously, it's got a post I mean, office. That's, what, that's I mean, how you got everything you needed just to set up. A you get a TV account. company interested that said, "So what are you going to do?" I said, and we went, "We're going to go and with a minimum <laughs> amount of kit and yeah. and planning, we're going to go take over this town and make it function." It's a ghost town. You'll get to watch people in a like people with a bit of nous acting in a, more or less, as far as your TV, t your t your television audience is concerned, is a post-apocalyptic situation. Yeah. And we'll go and we'll try and make it work politically and socially and technologically. You know, just just go in there and re basically build <laughs> civilization from the ground up, as if. Something had wiped out a large portion of the local people, and that would be fairly compelling television, yeah. And just sort of people that were just like, right, okay, I'm techno, and you could sort of see, you know, some of these people are going to look well nerdy on television. You have got something going. There. I mean, have you ever seen us in a group? Fucking yep. hell, we look weird in a group, man. Yeah. You're definitely going to have enough interest in people <laughs> to to focus in on and to chat with, because <laughs> those everybody in, in that has got yeah. You're definitely going to have enough it's not characters. Not a very homogenous group, <laughs> but the thing is, is everybody's got a speciality. I, there's some really weird, wide-ranging specialities. The opportunity for cross-learning off people would be incredible. You'd go there and you'd learn everything. Everything that was even remotely important. Yeah. Oh, I bet. That that just be you know. So we're gonna you know we need you to secure permission for us from the Indian company to do that. Yep. We need a certain amount of funding to go there. Yeah, it's 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 privately owned. It was bought for seven million, I think, the whole town. So I mean, you know, yeah. even if we were able to raise a, a, a fraction of that um, to buy part of it, or I mean, seven million for a town is really cheap. <laughs> just to be, I mean, just to put that in perspective. I mean, even if we, you know had a fraction of that because and the guy the guy is interested yeah. in importing uh scientists and artists and i don't know if we exactly qualify as that but no, i just, think we could squeeze saying, into it's that a, it's role an art project we needed the, to. the actual product at the end of it is a society or it's just like flat a, out a civil a portion union. of it the like basically Yeah, before the infrastructure yeah. starts to fall apart. And I would think as a landowner that he'd rather have people come in there sooner rather than later. I mean, he can sit there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he can and sit there and, and, and dump income. millions of dollars into it over, you know, I think 20 years. Or he can have, you know, a few people living it there now, improving it. Just like, you know, give us a budget and we'll build so. a functioning ecosystem uh, yeah. you know community and you know with some output you know imagine it imagine just going in and saying right you know yeah i think so yeah yeah and just say we're going to do a town and literally cut these people off yeah who was the company that did colony was that discovery <laughs> i need to get them yeah. interested in it yeah I don't know. I think I was a bit difficult with them, but I, I was I was really really. And you were already on the Prepper UK across. thing, so two they'd want you. And a half they'd want you back before they even <laughs> touched dirt. And they came round and they did some preliminary filming, and then they came back <laughs> to do their filming. And it was like, dude, you know, I'm try I'm so trying to get this across to you. This lifestyle is, you know, and I wish I'd been able to quote Vanu a bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm insulating myself from the effects of societal change. Or change in my life. I just want I would just want to look around and know I can fix everything. It's very relaxing, you know. If, if you fuck it up, you know, it's a tent. I can just go somewhere else. You know, mm -hmm. but I'm also 
I've also spent time mm-hmm. in the woods enough that I can just fuck off with like five minutes notice and yeah. not come back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the great thing about all the new um, fabrics and stuff like that, yeah. or even the old ones, is you can repair them. So, I you mean, know, and even if you have got if luxuries you, like the worst you know, thing that's ever going to happen is your tent's going to rip. It's very easy tarp to is going to rip, and, and you're going to have to repair it. You know, that's either a blockage or you know, you sewing so needle and thread. Hands. It's not that hard. You know, or you can even you can even in a pinch you could reinforce it with a few layers of duct mm-hmm. tape. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the things I want to do on the TV show is a thing I call the apocalypse game, where and you can recycle the tanks you're in too, a piece of wood so you can, or you're in an yeah. urban environment. You just sort of like yeah. you know you press the button and say, right, what do you do? There's no one around. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? And it's really interesting, especially if you're in the woods. If you start spotting things like litter, litter becomes valuable in that sort of circumstance. Old glass bottles, old plastic <laughs> bottles, you know, um, bits of even crisp packets and drinks cans. Those are all, you know, even bits of paper, even just random exactly. household debris, all becomes valuable. Tin cans, you know, baked bean tin cans. Mm-hmm. The yeah. lightest. The lightest stoves uh, made and for backpacking are because people are wasteful of, of what is custom very workable metal out of I mean, aluminum. You couldn't make. You couldn't. I mean, you, c- you cannot make much. a lighter you one. Make a lightweight knife uh, out, out of, of anything of else. <laughs> you know, you c- just about. But it would be a good starting point, and all you need to do to smelt it is fire. Doesn't even need to be particularly hot fire. If you fat, if mm-hmm. you dig a little pit under a bunch of aluminium cans, you'll get, you know, you'll get a lump of aluminium in that sort of shape. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you've got workable metal because people waste it so much, and it's not, it's not the most common metal on earth either. That's the weird thing. It's quite expensive, <laughs> but it's. Oh, here's an interesting thing. I can't remember the um, Graffin was talking about it. There's a particular beer. That now, now comes in a metal bottle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think it's Heineken, but it's it's just really weird. It's like like a metal bottle. You just think, imagine hmm. finding one of those. And it's not but Heineken. It's strong enough to hold beer. Like that. That you know, all you have to do then is find a stopper, and you've got a water container. You can scavenge those all over the place. Yeah. You can figure it out, no problem. But you know, soon in the yeah. wilderness, because people are dumb and they like littering, you'll be out in the woods. You'll be able to come across like one of these bottles, and you, you just think your dreams have come true. If you're really scavenging and for having a hard time, you just think that's a brilliant find. But there's so many things you can make out of workable aluminium; it's insane. There's so many little things mm-hmm. that are better if they're made out of metal that you could just redo in aluminium just by finding a couple of beer cans. Yeah, yeah, I've been saving um, these. Uh, what is it? Starbucks double shot espresso can because you can make stoves out of them. So I've saved a couple of those, and um, a lot of the uh, brands from Mexico um, or Thailand or anything. Anyways, their their cans are made out of something else. I don't know if it's tin or or just a heavier gauge aluminum or whatever it is, but um, I've saved a couple of those. Yeah, um, loads of things like that. Had coconut think, juice right, in them. I can, I can and from the wreckage of society, end up using I can make those for uh, camp quite cooking a bit of things pots. That would have been impossible because they're pretty strong. Hold of. You could reuse them. That are just lying around, like bicycle inner tube. And stuff like that. But you think, wow, mm-hmm. 101 different uses for that. Yeah. But, you know, sort of like there's so much wasted and landfill. And have a couple of 
to the point where I've files I've on hand like too, in case you need to make wary a knife. of buying new stuff now. <laughs> you know, because there's so much stuff just floating around secondhand that people aren't. That is just isn't you. You're you're getting something out of it, but it's not either. It's not in landfill, and it's not encouraging yeah. companies to make lots more of the thing that you've just bought. Oh, yeah, t horrifying. Yeah. I'd have to well, say, I just though, watched a Tesco documentary not too long ago a, about food waste. A couple of companies now and that do was a, a thing where insane. any food is given away to the homeless. Yeah, that you know, blew my mind food. how much you just think, well, food fuck for that, you know, people are wasting. But, you know, cans going just out of sell-by date and stuff like that being destroyed or, you know, just like all the energy that that wastes. That's good, yeah. You know, and the shipping and the growing of it, the packaging of it, everything. You just think, no, this can't be okay. Yeah. It was called uh, uh, Just Eat It. That's what it was called. And this, these people literally, like, got thousands of dollars worth of food. Yeah. It's in, it, uh, to sustain them for for six months, and at the end of the six months, they ended up making a huge yeah, meal and giving got, some of it away to make everything because like they had so much better. so much food they couldn't even eat it all. Around. There's loads of stuff that can make loads of people's lives much much better, and lots of technology that just is being so underused. That's why I started calling government uh, anybody that works for a government or a major corporation a, a traitor to humanity. This is just you are, you know, that, that you're out there, you're doing this, these things for an imaginary amount of money. And your reasons for not doing them is that <laughs> your company or government wouldn't make as much money. When, you know, it's, oh, it's just the amount of wastage is just insane in everything. You know, is that... Yeah, well, ostensibly they were saying, um, I, th I believe, yeah, I believe that documentary was set in Canada, and um, and there's there's a law that uh, protects the companies from being prosecuted if if they give yeah. away food. Which sounds like bullshit to me. And yet they still would not do it. The thinking government would say, okay, right, they okay. Uh, you know, we're afraid of getting sued you know, or given, something. Ostensibly, that's what they were saying. You don't get to sue if you get ill. So, Okay, you just don't get to sue. Those yeah. companies, you know... Yeah, you ha you know, this does, you know, this is completely affects your statutory rights because we're giving it here. Yeah. It's easy. It affects them in these these, these, these ways. disclaimer. I mean, it's like obviously, one paragraph. if it's ever proven yeah, that they're poisoning the food that they give away deliberately, then they're going to jail. But until that day, if you eat something and it's mm -hmm. way way past its sell by date, but you've been given it, you don't get to sue the company. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and even even yeah. if um, somebody has to go and sign up for a card where they have to sign a waiver and the card pretty much says I have signed this waiver Yeah. and you produce your card when they give you a big wok of food even that would be better you know just say look you have to have this Like, and we're not going to be dicks about it the guy over there that makes the cards is over there you literally go and tell him your name sign the mm -hmm. form he takes your photo you're on the card five minutes later you come back and we give you some food you know, we'll make it as easy as we possibly fucking can. But you don't get to sue us. Well, fair enough. I mean, if they don't even, they wouldn't even have, I don't think they should even have to pay for distribution. So people will go and pick it up. You know, charities mm -hmm. will go and pick it up from a central depot. Yeah. You know, you don't have to take it anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, they actually um, they interviewed a guy who was basically <coughs> doing that too. I mean, you can do it, you can do it straight at at the supermarket, or you can have, you know, this this other guy. Especially because you know, uh, yeah. if you have a charity or something, then um, they can pick up everything food. that just says, you know, Best Buy 
date because on it or something packed, instead of an expiry date because hatch. a best buy date and expiry There's date no are two different things it's all pasteurized so you know they can go to the store part. pick up everything Canned that says best buy really and then give it mm -hmm. ever yep yeah yep yeah they've i can't remember yeah, what it was, it was completely edible it they wasn't found as good you know some kind of food from like a famous shipwreck or something like that i can't well, remember which one it is i think they found cans of beans yeah, they, from the american civil war yeah it's like 25 years and old still been underwater because it was you know, everything like that you know you can open it up and it's, I mean, it's it really, still edible it's, and it's one of those things you're unlikely to live you know as long as you're alive when it was canned yeah. you're probably good you know mm -hmm. as long as it's not sort of like two three hundred years old you're probably all right with it. You know, it's canned. And it's just... Right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it kind of... Occasionally, if you go... If you shop at a supermarket where they do do discounts, it is nice to always go, oh, actually, you know, I mean, that's made up my mind what's for dinner tonight. That's massively discounted. It goes out of date today, but there's nothing much wrong with it. But, I, you know, I'd far rather that was, you know, making sure that somebody... You know, I'd far rather buy something else and know that if it was going to go out of date, it was mm -hmm. immediately being handed out to people that really needed it. I could live without my surprise discounts on shit that's about to go out of date. But it's... Oh, that's, this is why I get so annoyed with it all. These, these are all very solvable things. And you either have to... You know, you either yeah. need a situation where everybody is actually vaguely moral and sees the light once it's explained to them. Or you have a mad fascistly socialist dis, um, dictatorship, where you, you, where somebody does have the power to go. No, you're being a dick. I will change the law. I will change the law on you so fast it will make your head spin. Or you can come up with a solution. Those are your choices. Figure it out. You know, a bene I think a lot of people say a benevolent dictatorship is probably the best thing that humanity could achieve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, even in other parts of well, the world where, you know, people are just, not people are just afraid thing, of, takes of a long time to you change. know, being litigated to death is this, instead I think of people helping don't people. don't like the idea of other um, people getting something for nothing. Or something for less. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, everybody's going to have to, you know, we don't all live equal lifestyles. Mm -hmm. Usually the people that hate the idea of ha other people having something for mm -hmm. less have got loads more money than the people that are getting it for less. You know, the idea of very, very wealthy people, you know, subsidizing poorer people. They really hate that. Despite the fact they've generally made their lots of money off the backs of very poor people. Very few people are rich where they haven't oppressed anybody. Very few. You know, somewhere on the line, someone's losing out for somebody to make that much profit. You know, if it's the head of a corporation, it's because his corporation manufactures stuff in developing countries where it's cheaper for labor, meaning that other people in the world don't get a job. You know, if it's, if it's uh, you know, if it's somebody that's invented something, then great. But, you know, if they have, they've made millions and millions, they're right. keeping the price of their yeah. product artificially high. If you're making a huge amount of profit, your profit margin must be so high, which means that you are defrauding people, really. They're no longer paying for the thing and then a mm -hmm. small amount because you had the idea for the thing. Whereas people tend to gouge and gouge and gouge because they've either paid for it to be developed or developed it themselves. So mm -hmm. all profit is oppression. I mean, I know that sounds very Marxist, but when somebody's making beyond a certain amount of profit, somebody's kind of suffering. Well, I just think, you know, most of us, if we had, if we were entrepreneurs and things like that and, and making oh. our own products, you know, yeah, I, 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 think I don't think I'd be okay would just with it. Say no. that I'm not gonna, I mean, even if I invented something totally off the cuff, a huge amount of work. cost for this. And that's Generally, just, I that's think just as our long as I had enough money to live a reasonable that's just lifestyle, what, how we I would kept do it. inventing stuff. 
and coming up with things that people wanted to get or that people were willing to pay for. I'd be all right with that. You know, if I was devoting a working week's worth of time to doing something, I don't necessarily want people to have to put their hands in their pockets to such a degree just because I've had this one clever idea or one idea that's really caught on. But that's where this whole free market anarchy comes in. You know, if it's fair, mm -hmm. then people aren't going to mind. That's why I, I, I quite like funding Kickstarters. Yeah, and well, and generally in that kind of society, I mean, it's yeah. it's arguable, but um, generally accepted. There's not going to be any kind of intellectual property, and if there is, it's going to be impossible to enforce. So, you know, the cost yeah. of everything goes down because everybody's making cheaper oh, versions I wanted to of make, everything make else. A point I mean, it's kind of already happening with a little Alibaba way, with Express the online and, purchasing and stuff like you know, that. Uh, the, as far you know, as I'm all these concerned, the world is unstable enough a place in China. If you can get like a good knife or a good <clears> axe <throat> for ten dollars, and order it yeah. like a Chinese copy of it that's just as good or made in the same factory, do it. You know, do it because you know. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people are kind of like buy American or buy British. Those companies don't mm -hmm. care about you. You know, yeah. in a lot of cases, they it might be a British or an American company, but it's outsourced its production to that factory. You know, by buying that. All right. Well, I'm, uh, and I don't want to sing, single out any particular company for this, but there are a lot of um, oh, say, American say that British one more time because you cut out say, there for oh, a we're I a British sure company. Everybody heard that. You should buy from us rather than buy a Chinese copy. The copies are being made in exactly the same factory as the actual thing so um, given the the fact that you know the world is an unstable place if there is something you need and you can afford it only if you buy it overseas from overseas like from Alibaba or Gearbest or something like that then buy it still get it and spend the money you saved on the other things that you need if it's something that you you know having it now is way better than having it in six months Mm -hmm. so you know if, if if it's like yeah. you know I, I don't know like ammunition or a particular type of canned food that will last a really long time yep. and it's actually a good product I agree with that get it yeah well we were talking about um, the uh, comm situation uh, a little while ago, the uh, electronic headsets. I went and had an order them. Oh, fucking so, let's know about um, those. Get my have my ear more. Uh, I'm, I'm M32, a huge fan of Ganzo knives. Uh, radio headsets say, coming, and they've been sort and, of flagged as being problematic and stuff. And, yeah. Oh, they're they they're sort of copies of other American-made knives, and they're made in the same factory as a lot of the major mm -hmm. knife makers in America. It's just that they've got a slightly different metal on the blade or a slightly different fastening. But those, that I'd have to say, and I'm not being paid by Ganzo to say this, but if they want to send me some knives, mm -hmm. that's cool. But they do, they they do make a good knife, and you can get a knife for like a tenth of the price, and it would mean that you'd have a good tactical folder, <laughs> rather than not have it, or not be able to justify it quite yet. You know, get the Ganzo one now. Save up if you want to for the for the real deal, because you if yeah. you need it to be made of a particular metal, but get the copy thing that works well now and then if nothing happens and the economy remains stable and you're doing really well and you really really still want something from the actual original company then buy it it's a bit like you know yeah I don't I don't really understand elect, like elect, intellectual property on on things like clothing because it's like okay so i can see the clothing i can draw a picture of it yeah. and i well, just so happen to be able to produce this get, cheaper like, than it's been sold. 3d scan it so why is this a problem um then uh you know then mm -hmm. 3d printing as an industry will take right off 
If you can put if you can put your broken doohickey into a scanner and have it run you off a new one, then yeah, do that. I mean, weird thing about 3D printing is you can yeah, actually walk every... into a store and buy a 3D printer over the counter. <laughs> Literally walk yeah. in, pick one up. I mean, they're more expensive than the ones you build yourself, but I mean. They're... So while, yeah, yeah. So in the future, we're all well, going to have even a like a little trying to Chinese factory minus the exploitation um, in our house stock, as in the stuff you print with, <laughs> out of old milk bottles. So you know, so it will just literally you'll shred it. It will go in. It will be melted down and then extruded as print stock. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So you're producing, you know, just by dint of being alive and drinking the odd bit of milk, you're actually producing. That's getting like Star Wars so or when you Star Trek territory there. You've already racked up like awesome. a couple of kilos of feedstock. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, I'll just run this bad boy off. And if you if you if you put that with some kind of three dimensional scanner, which isn't an impossible thing, they have built them to just scan an object, <laughs> and then just run that object off. Maybe alter it slightly so it's less broken. But if you've glued the pieces back together and you know that it won't, the part won't deal with the, the environment it's got to be in, glue it back together and then just print one off. Out of old milk bottles. That makes... That reminds yeah. me again of... Uh of defense distributed i was talking about them you know on on twitter a few years back um me 3d printing um uh rifle magazines so you know that just it just popped in my memory because you know the the uh yeah legislation is is looming again so if they try oh. to do a ban like they did in 94. They're going to have, have a lot tape, more trouble this time. There, there was a chap that mentioned that went off into an anti-left-wing rant on YouTube um, about the Las Vegas shooting. And uh, it just reminded me of it. You know, you think you're talking about gun magazines. <laughs> and the guy was... Because there was a bit of fake news rattling around saying that mm -hmm. the guy was left-wing and supported by ISIS and shit. And this guy yeah. went into a complete meltdown on camera about how we've got to start, you know, fighting back against this left-wing menace. And it was like, um, and I put in a comment saying, well, like all the reports show that it was highly conservative member of the NRA, just mm -hmm. a gun nut who was, you know, very dismissive of people that he thought were poorer than him. So it was by, basically, unfortunately, it was another right-wing dickhead. Well, yeah, I mean, you 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 want me to? But it was you just really weird. After, after, after there are no Since comments after up, that comment on this. <laughs> and I, and I, there I'll are hundreds be, of comments. I'll, I'll be I made uh, that post. brief if you want me. And to they've be, all stopped but dead. I'll weigh on just that simple part. And it's just like, uh... yeah, yeah. Well, one of one of the first one of the first videos that I saw um, about this, uh, even before I saw the you know the complete footage of, of what actually happened, um, uh, James Yeager, um, firearms trainer, came on and he said um, he was he was implying that this was either um, ISIS or uh, Antifa, and I. Um, I don't know where he got that, if he was just speculating that, or just throwing that out there or what, because there was, there was nothing as far as I know out about that. And he doesn't explain why he said that. So, um, <clears throat> as far as that, um, is concerned, um, you know, I think he was just kind of throwing it out there. I did link the video because the rest of his comments about, about stopping a, a mass shooter and, and his his conjecture about that, I think was valuable. Um, <clears throat> however, you know we've had we've had the brother and and mainstream media, presumably from their own sources, but 
maybe not, um, say that he he was not political at all. We've had other people saying that um, saying that uh, he again from an unnamed source linked from the Guardian said that the, he knew him and he was conservative, and then the other side saying that he is involved with ISIS or, or Antifa and I think that the the I if anything the ISIS connection is is more plausible than the rest of it but the whole I am going to speak a little bit about the whole Antifa thing because I I you know we've we've had comments before this even happened uh, about that kind of organization huh. and um like, uh, in, 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 in fact, hours before this happened, we were talking about, like, you know, what was we're probably like, talking about it as it happened, an, to be honest. A, an hour or two, maybe before this whole happened, we were, we were talking, we, that came up in conversation, but anyways, yeah, yeah, um, but, uh, the, the thing with Anifa, uh, from me, from my perspective, anyways, is, I, I don't know what kind of organization they are now at all. I don't. I I have no knowledge of it. All I have is is little bits on YouTube that I see. Um but I I did look into them when I was when I was a rowdy teenager. Um and you know, looked at looked at what they're talking about and, and they were saying, Okay, uh punch a punch a Nazi and everything and you know Nazis, obviously, you know, greatest super villain um, ever. Uh, I loved playing Wolfenstein as a kid. Uh, you know, there's something visceral about, you know, fighting Nazis. I don't know what it is. But um, but anyway, you know, at, at, at some level, they were like, oh, yeah, punch a Nazi, okay. Um, and they're talking about, you know, this, this kind of action against... Um, against neo-nazi groups at that time um and from you know i was like okay well that's you know that's interesting um y you know i can i can almost sympathize and and to some extent agree with that <clears throat> but um you know the and at that time they were fighting people who were clearly self-identified as nazis Okay, so the difference between the group now that I see yeah. and the group then is now they're attacking people who don't even self-identify as Nazis. So that's kind of problematic. And the the other thing that I kind of had a problem with, um, you know, personally is um, I'm I'm looking at these these groups and um, unless they're, you know. Uh, threatening violence, or or have are proven to be initiating acts of violence. You know that they, they they've got proof that they're beating people up or or harassing them or whatever. Um, <clears throat> then uh, you know I have unfortunately I have to say First Amendment there, and I'm not saying that to be one-sided because I would say the same thing about uh, the Deacons for Self-Defense, the Black Panthers, the Black Nationalists. I would say the same thing for them, you know, and it's, and it's like, you, you know, if, if they, if they want to ha have their own self-determination and in autonomy and separation, from society because that's yeah, what they want to do it's the, like, the problem with i think i'm sorry but i can't fault them for that they're spreading their net as far as who is a fascist and who isn't a bit wide and drawing attention to the fact and not being the people who wait until hostilities are initiated right, right. i'm all for a bunch of fairly well-trained people basically riding security on a left-wing demonstration mm -hmm. so if right-wing people show up and cause violence then there are people there that know how to control it. Um, oh, absolutely. And and 
real briefly on that, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, what I believe what, Harle what Harlequin was linking there was the John Brown Gun Club. And these are basically, you know, left-leaning people that have firearms. And um, I, I would recommend and show up to demonstrations. <laughs> um, I would recommend, you know, what, there's an interview with them on Never Enough Ammo's channel. And, and he talks about them and he's trying, yeah, he's trying to, um, to basically to find a middle ground because he's not really left leaning, but you know, he's, mm. he's, he's trying to find a middle ground. And I think, you know, people of any kind of po political persuasion being armed is a good thing. And I think, you know, honestly, if, if I could, uh, if I could organize it in a way that I didn't think, you know, we'd, we'd all get arrested. I would say have armed people at protests whether and it doesn't matter what their political situation is have armed people yeah. at protests that are completely um as non-biased as you can be and just providing security for the people who totally are balanced. expressing their viewpoints but whether it's, it's on know, the right you, or whether it's on the left like that, it almost like, I would be all for politics that. Politics itself look like a distraction. You, know, you just feel, you say, I don't really care what your politics are. Polit politics are just don't be a dick. Just like I mean, and internationally not being a dick. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I believe uh, yeah, it's, being I, armed I it, is, is a human in, right. And if you accept that as a truism that translates to everyone forced to get their own way you know whether they're on my side or not whether they're you know whether they're tr doing something positive or doing something negative you know any organized group of people will attempt to use force on lesser organized groups of people so you know the fascists basically want to tell you what to do and who you know what their ideas of racial purity and well want to maintain i a think conservative i think on everything uh, and the leftists want everybody to be accepted for who they are and to do pretty much what they want. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think the truth is somewhere more like we need to look after those people that need looking after. And we need to work to make sure that that can happen. And we need to have certain things in order to maintain lifestyle. We need infrastructure. We need you know somebody to organize that. There is a lot to be said for anarchy. But you still, you know, that doesn't mean without any organization. It just means that nobody's actually in charge. Because when you have someone in charge, their their stupid ideas have a habit of becoming law. Right. So you there is you strive for consensus. You know, but if you let everybody demand everything that they think they mm -hmm. want without any restraint, hey. there aren't the resources to provide everybody with the lifestyle they'd like. So we need to. You, you basically need. So people that are smart enough to say right this is what needs to be available Correct. and anything else you can make available this is what should be a right you know a certain amount of protection for the people that can't defend themselves you can't have absolute anarchy i mean that's the wild west you know you'd have people gunning people down in saloons and shit like that and everybody just getting on with it you know in, in, unless mm. you had well adjusted well balanced people who would just get on with it and do it which you're not going to not not well, for many I think, decades I think after that... you introduce this perfect system you do need a certain amount of yeah regulation in a society until people learn you need regulation but with equal opportunity so people have a few generations to learn not to try and oppress other people Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and 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 regulation can can come I'll, in I'll, a lot of different forms. I mean, I'll give you be, a small example of be how that economic has worked, or or social. But it's only a very small in a way example. That, you know, years ostracizing years years ago, certain people. When I was a child like that. and a teenager, people used to make drunk jokes about mm -hmm. being drunk driving. Like they'd been drunk and they'd been driving, and people would make jokes about that. Bill Hicks makes a few jokes about that. Um. Mm. now if you sort of brought it if yeah. you went to a dinner party yeah any in any right. social strata like it became illegal to drink drive and now it's at a point where 
people have actually taken a minute because they don't do it routinely. Mm -hmm. If you went to a dinner party and you said, oh, yes, I had a funny drive home the other night. I drank so much beer, I could hardly see the police, yeah. siren, police lights on the car in front. And nobody would find it funny. Everybody would think you recklessly endangered hundreds of lives on <laughs> the drive home. Yeah. My child could have been driving. Right. It's not socially acceptable. It's not an okay thing to do. But in yep. the course of my lifetime, it's gone from unregulated, you might get a slap on the wrist, to heavily regulated, you could go to jail, to socially regulated, you wouldn't do it. In the span of 30 years. And that's only a very small example, but it's a way that you can change mm -hmm. through regulation. If you regulate yeah. against yeah. things that are bad, that somebody doing it would be bad and there should, needs to be a penalty and it needs to be become socially unacceptable, you can regulate a society's viewpoint for the better. Well, in, in cases that... Um where it was just plain out economically unfeasible to enforce certain behavior, you know, we, we did it all socially, you know, you're all always socially ostracized, um, for, for, you know, doing, doing bad things and it, it worked, but, um, uh, uh, to get back to a point, the point you were making earlier about, um, being armed and stuff is, I uh, through every example I have seen throughout my life and this is just my personal experience but from everything that I've seen if somebody uh, yeah uh, being armed has a deterrent effect against violence just simply being armed not it's it's so it in my experience it has the opposite effect that most people think is that being armed it does not cause more violence. It actually deters violence because they they know the means are there to take it way past the the that point, you know, to to get to the kind of overkill. I will shut this shit down level, um, and so people don't people don't ever take it there. People don't get in a fist fight because there's a guy standing there with a rifle or a pistol on his hip, you know, like being armed has deterred violence in my life personally just because people know that i hadn't had a knife when i was a teenager just because people know that you know i have guns but as an adult the they won't press things if so far has a gun to the point where it becomes and a somebody fight is emotionally or, or becomes violent psychologically super disturbed <clears throat> by something that's just happened to them the chances for it, something escalating well out of control is far higher I mean, I, I will agree with you absolutely that if you are armed, somebody's decision to annoy you or get in your face or try and deliberately yeah. upset you or injure you or mm -hmm. rob you, that goes way, way down. The flip side of everybody being armed is every domestic argument becomes potentially more lethal. Right. Every disagreement between two people at a bar becomes a lot more dangerous i'm not talking about I mean, if you talk about blanket gun ownership yeah, it takes some as opposed to responsible gun ownership then you've yeah yeah but you'd have to, though you, you'd have to have a disciplined society right. it takes discipline for sure. and i think there are some places yeah. in the world and there are some small towns in america where it is a disciplined society yeah but if you try and rob you know the local five and dime store the chances are one or more of the patrons will be armed you know, then those robberies go down. Like the zero burglary rate of the town where it's illegal not to have mm -hmm. a gun. Because they worked out it would be cheaper for police officers if the, the number of violent incidences would go right down if you knew yeah. for a fact everybody had a gun. But, you know, you have this problem, whereas if everybody does have a gun but doesn't have the dis this, this personal discipline to go along with owning the means of taking someone out of being alive, if you have that power then there's a certain amount of responsibility that goes with that power. Mm -hmm. So you're you're expecting a lot of humanity. You know, I'd yeah. love to see a world like that, For sure. but immediately a world like that would mean guns were, were unnecessary. 
they'd suddenly become unnecessary overnight because everybody would be disciplined enough to not lose their temper at someone they've never met before or not lose their temper with someone. Well, it's it's a re it's a really yeah. Oh, that shit occurs really if you're carrying feeling, a stick, though, mate. Like people's it's reactions a, it's change. A super if, weird if you're in like, England and you're walking along, you've got a big when, fucking uh, stick because you've just found a piece of wood and you think, yeah. I, could, I, I quite like a walking <laughs> stick for this wander along, and you pick up your temporary walking stick. People give you a lot wider berth. They don't know they're doing it, and it's not overt, but people really do. I showed it to my dad when yeah. we were out walking. We went all the way through yeah. these woods and stuff, and I picked up a stick. <laughs> I said, I always like to have a stick because, you, you know, you're a bit more stable. You can make a better pace with a stick. You know, and I just sort of fashioned myself a bit of a walking stick, stripped the bark off it because I had my Leatherman with me, made it more comfortable, mm -hmm. sort of carved a little groove in it and removed a few of the, removed the branches and sort of like made it more comfortable to hold. And it made sure it was the right height. And I was walking along with it and people came walking along the path and they made such a wide berth for us. And you saw the, you saw the whole group dynamic change. You know, and that's just a stick. It's like yeah. a subconscious understanding of someone has a big stick. If you fuck with them, they can wail on you with it. Well, well, I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of bringing up the sort of the opposite scenario in a sense because, like, like for instance, yeah. um, when I was, I was with, uh, <laughs> you know, Hatter Madness, right? I had, I had met him, you know, a handful of times. Or something like that and you know we were like hey we're, let's go in the middle of the national forest and and bring a shotgun and i'm gonna bring you know my rifle and and my other shotgun and and you know things like that and we, you know we're gonna go in the middle of the national forest and we're gonna shoot and just being like okay cool let's do it i mean there's there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of trust that you gain in somebody knowing yeah. that they could end your life if they wanted to and get away and get away with it you know i mean there's nothing you could do yeah i mean there's and and conversely like when i'm training other people it's like there's certain people that that i'm not going to tell about that i own guns that i'm not going to say let's go out and train yeah. but the people that i do choose you know, you have a tremendous amount of trust in them yeah. afterwards. I mean, if you know, gun yeah, ownership turn around was universally me acceptable, away, if they say, were so inclined. Yeah, like, let's just say you have a sensible government, and they just want to know that you can use strip and fire that gun accurately, and then you can have anything you want. But they need to know that you can take it apart and clean it and maintain it, and you you have to go through. You basically do what mm -hmm. the army does with people with guns, especially in this country. You can't just give English people guns and not expect them to go, whoa. Yeah. You know, because we don't see guns all that often. When we see guns, we're like... I mean, I still get this weird feeling when <laughs> I see a, an obviously armed police officer. And I live in Manchester where there was a major terrorist attack not too long ago. And there were p police with guns all over the place. Mm. And the very English part of me just went, whoa, you know, that's a bit that's a bit off. Wow, they're wandering around with guns. Yeah. Why can we see the guns? We shouldn't. These are British bobbies. They shouldn't be armed. And there were just loads of guys yeah. with guns running around. And you can't... And there is a fascination we have with them because we don't, <laughs> most people don't right. have them. That, you know, when, you, when if, if you're going in the army, they have to make the gun the most boring, heavy, unlikable thing that you have in your kit. So you're not tempted to just sort of like, you know, act like a dickhead with it. And once you make someone clean a gun and take it apart <laughs> and put it back together yeah. and then clean it again and take it apart and do that and all that, and yeah. make them shoot so many thousand rounds through it and make them lug it like 20 miles on a route march and shit like that. Once you do that with them, they're not indifferent to the gun, but they've started to regard the gun as less of a toy and more of a tool. This is the tool that keeps you and your buddies alive if you're being shot at. It's not to be toyed mm -hmm. with. It's not for you to tinker or fuck around with. It's not for you to wave in the air. It's not for you to put it at your hip and try and yeah. fire it fully automatic. It's there to do a job. It's a tactical scalpel. You're reaching out and you're taking that person out so that he doesn't shoot your mate. That's what yep. they train you to do. And all the other yeah. times that you're not being shot at, you'll resent having to carry it. Yep. Because it's heavy. It's not fun. It's not cool. 
it's a big hot lump of metal and you're in a desert and you've only got a certain mm -hmm. number of rounds of ammunition and you know that when you're in barracks you're going to have to fire it 500 times a week and all that shit and then you're going to have to strip it down after every time you fire it and clean it and then people will come by to make sure you've cleaned it properly and put it back together properly and will scream at you if you don't and then you'll have to lug it across an assault course you know it's you know, it's important, you know, and you have to do, I think you have to do that with guns. It's heavy, it's a massive responsibility. We have to sign you off on a short philosophy course, or a short civics yeah. course, or a short understanding of what consent is and all this sort of shit. You have to do, you have to be, mm -hmm. if, as long as we can determine you're a, you're a reasonable human being, you can have a fucking gun, mate. If you're, if you're the sort of person that's going to lose their temper easily, or get provoked easily, you can't have one. Yeah. You know, you can, you can have a gun as soon as you prove that you're self-disciplined enough to wield the power of death over another mm -hmm. human being and not act like a dickhead with it. And in that sort of society, where you had to be checked out on it and determined mentally and physically fit to own one, you would possibly have a thing where when people went to do a violent crime, it's that they would think, if there is a single reasonable person in the vicinity of this, I'm going to get lit up. That would be a deterrent. Somebody that's going to make a choice whether I live or die yeah. when I do this thing I'm about to do is absolutely. nearby, probably. Was... And they will light me up because they'll be absolutely sure what is a righteous kill. Yeah. And that would be a society where being armed would be worthwhile having. Yep. Unfortunately, nobody wants to tell some people that they're unfit to own a weapon. You know, nobody wants to do that deep uh, a set of um, legislation. Everybody wants to do a quick thing mm -hmm. and then get re-elected next term. Nobody wants to sit down and figure out what the best thing to do is. Yeah. I mean, it's... And who decides that? You know. It's incredibly... Ooh. I mean... Uh, it's an in it's an incredibly touched issue. It's... it's in in completely it's very complicated i mean i would i would like you know to say that yeah everybody that's you know seen a, a psychiatrist or something or a psychologist and and has xyz issue you know shouldn't shouldn't have a gun or everybody that you know should own a gun should have this certain training but it's like uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the trick. I have a, I have you, a hard time placing certain. that line where that line and is going to exist. Once you've got it right, you would have to enshrine it yeah. in law so hard so that nobody trying to get a quick election result would be able to dismantle it or call it into question. You'd have to do it precisely right. That's why it's so difficult. But I, you know, and if that was the case, I wouldn't care if I saw somebody walking down the road in Britain with a with a you know a 45 on their hip openly while they were doing the shopping you know if i knew that person was a reasonable human being would make a judgment yeah. call and would understand what the responsibilities yeah. were should if they draw that weapon in anger that they are absolutely sure in their mind mm -hmm. that they're doing the right thing i would be happy to see everybody i i've you know everybody in a in a town all wearing guns or carrying a concealed I'd be totally happy. You know, that would be okay. But the thing is, is that it would probably wipe out a lot of crime. Yeah. Genuinely would, I think, wipe out a lot well, of crime. Well, it's a lot like what they do Certainly in Canada. Certainly spree shooters and stuff like that, or people just yeah. about out to commit murder or mayhem or rape or anything like that would seriously think twice before they went after injuring another human being. And, but that's the trick yep. of it, you know. That you're, I'm, I'm an anarchist calling for legislation. You know, I'm not comfortable with it. But that's that's probably the scenario you'd need. <laughs> well, I mean, calling for training is is you know one thing. You know, calling well, even even psychological profiles. I mean. You could no, yeah, enforce you could that completely so, on a free market basis, being like you can become you can become uh, you know, licensed if, to license people. If you're to have if you're a firearms dealer, then 
Yeah, you can. Well, I mean, if you're a firearms dealer, you can say, okay, well, uh, to be able to sell you this gun, I need to have a f- clean bill of health from the from the psychiatrist or whatever. You know, you could you could do it that way, but I mean, then again, it's just yeah. like like the the line that the psychiatrist draws. That's that's. I mean, if you if you have really an AI hard to to pin down, but did it? You know, because we've all been depressed. That would ask you a before. series of questions that knew what the you know the variances in human response were. Yeah. And you had an AI make the judgment. You know, some something you'd have to have something completely impartial, and then that would be the decision. Mm-hmm. As long as you absolutely set up the AI correctly, and it filtered people out. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think there'd be some questions yeah. on there I mean, about like, well, how do you feel about your government? Read, you know, your response as in, <laughs> well, yes, I'm not a massive fan Sadly. of government, as opposed to somebody who redlines and becomes murderously enraged. You know, it would be able to tell whether you questioned your government, which, you know, yeah. that's the point of democracy. And whether you were likely to... Um, go to the rally of a, of, right. a of, of somebody you didn't agree with and start lighting it up from a high building nearby they're two very different things and two very different responses you get from someone but you'd have to have yeah. an AI that would be able to filter out sociopaths you know it would have to be that good yeah mm. it's a it's a tremendous responsibility and you know it, it weighs on. To be honest, man, me if, if I lived in America, I would, I would definitely know, own like, guns. I, I have no the power of life it. and death. It among, it's hard, uh, you know. As soon as I got the opportunity to own, yeah. a, you know, a handgun and a rifle and a shotgun, I would. And it would just be like, right, I know I'm not going to just wander out into the street and start picking yeah. people off randomly. Even on my worst day, I couldn't shoot someone that I'd never met. On my worst day, I could shoot someone that I knew was going to do something mm-hmm. terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, and I I know that I could defend yeah. you know my life, the life of people I cared about, and my property. And I just go, oh no, it's not going to happen. And I think that's a reasonable reason to own own guns in a country where guns are fairly common. I mean, you're up to one point six guns per head in America at the moment. That's mm-hmm. pretty prevalent. So, yeah, in America, if I was in your situation, <laughs> I completely agree with you. I would own yeah. firearms without without a shadow of a doubt. I might have, like, just... I wouldn't have, like, a wall of guns, but I would have a handgun, a shotgun, and a rifle. No question about it. Right. I might not have the best handgun, shotgun, and a rifle, but like you say, yeah. if someone's about to do something terrible to you, you pull a gun on them, they really are going to think twice. And I, I would try and give people that instant... You know, you, you yeah. have now to make this decision. I have absolutely, in my in my mind, I have a plan. And that plan involves either you going away, which would be great, or, you know, me blowing your head off. Which would be bad, but it's way better than letting you do what you plan to do to me. <laughs> yeah. Hey, DW, did you want to weigh in on this since you're uh, muted now? Really. <laughs> I mean, well, I okay. mean, it's fairly just, just obvious checking. that, that just I checking. would have a wall of guns, <laughs> not... And then they would all be like weird, obscure shit where that the ammunition <laughs> would cost more than rifle or something. Yeah, probably. Or well, a bit more like, practical Here's my collection of World War One anti-material exactly. rifles, yeah. which have <laughs> like, one round of ammunition is $500. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know a guy with a fifty cal. Oh, a fifty cal rifle. I know a guy. Actually, That's I know two guys. Cal rifles are cals. cheap when you're talking anti-material rifles. Yeah. Look out for PTR, PTRS, PTRD, Russian ones. <laughs> the ammunition that they use is like minimum mm-hmm. ten bucks a round. I saw one that was like. Uh, thing essentially a 20 yeah, millimeter Jim, cannon i was like wow just, i remember once i went to the imperial war Museum just made and they had me a, a display of a world bit. war one fighter aircraft and then they had a big wall display 
of stuff they'd taken out of it that the early pilots had taken with them into the air into the air and one of the things they had they had all these little bombs and handguns and all that sort of shit you know where you're flying that low that you can actually try and pick someone off with a pistol this is how primitive early flight was this is only about eight years after the Wright brothers first flew that the Royal, the Royal Flying wow. Corps was formed so they were like kites with engines mm-hmm. and uh, one of the weapons that they'd had in one of these very early reconnaissance aircraft was an elephant gun and I and I just sort of like looked at it and I was transfixed by this idea of <laughs> you know imagine yeah. you're flying one of these things that may or may not land you know you're, you're flying along is something so rickety it looks like a sewing machine with wings and you're puttering <laughs> through the air and you look across and you're in a German like one of the early albatrosses or something like that it's really like a, a plane so primitive the wings are shaped with scalloped edges because they thought that would work better it's like a really primitive looking plane it's like a box with a big framework with a tail on one end it's really <laughs> rickety looking looks like half an aircraft and uh, imagine looking across and being so close that not only can you see the pilot in his leather flying helmet with a walrus moustache but then you see him reach into the back of the cockpit not looking where he's going and come out with an elephant gun <laughs> and looking at something with a, like a one and a half inch bore across a few hundred terrifying. yards of air knowing that if if he even gr- there's no such thing as a as a near miss with this fucking thing it will destroy the aircraft with one shot if he if he even clips yeah. you <laughs> you know it's the things made of balsa wood and tissue paper and you look across yeah. and some mad bastard is pointing one of those at you. I thought, now well, that's a gun. <laughs> it's a gun guaranteed where you can look down it and you can, it's probably got a wide enough ball that you can see it, whether it's loaded or not. And just looking uh, down it. Are talking about Davis gun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just the recoil might would actually be even shatter safe for one the pilot to shoot that? I mean, wouldn't he like, like fly out the airplane? It's not the biggest recoil. Oh, they, uh, the Royal Armour is <laughs> yeah. in Leeds, which isn't too far away. Mm. They've got a couple of punt guns on display. <laughs> and that's a weapon with such a large recoil, you have to be in a boat to use it. And there's all these lists of things that have been shot with punt guns, because they're designed <laughs> to be used on marshland. And they were used by people that shot, um, shot lots and lots of birds all at once. And um, no, it's not a Davis gun. No, it's it's actually like for shooting elephants. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a big gun, though. Um, yeah, but that, but what you're looking at there with the Davis gun, if you looked at it, it's about eight feet long. That's about the size of a punt gun. And yeah, those you, you are lie mad. down. It's as long as the punt. You lie down hmm. in the punt, and you stock in this cartridge that is literally like the size of a pound of sugar. And they load this in, and then they fire it, and then nobody oh can God. shoot any birds on that particular <laughs> bit of marshland for a couple of days, because everything takes off when they hear it go off. And the list of shot with one round from a punt gun, it would be like 27 starlings, 45 egrets, 13 herons. And there'd be just this long list of like hundreds of, but because it fires just one big <laughs> bird shot cartridge. And it just will just annihilate anything within its cone of fire. Yeah. And they'd be listing off, you know, 135 starlings and shit. And you look at the lists of these animals shot with one shot. And that's it. Then we went home for the day. We literally laid in, paddled up to the birds and then pulled the trigger on this thing with our ear defenders on. And it just blew away everything in front of us. And we went and picked it up. And we got like a couple of gunny sacks full of birds. You know, it's just like. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But it was it was used by natural philosophers yeah, as great in way to people who do natural history <laughs> to to find out what was living on the marsh up until that point up until you blew half yeah. of it away. <laughs> now that's that was generally the attitude. It's not for hunting birds. It's for um, it's for natural history researchers of of the Victorian era. And you just think that's the most dis, you know destructive way of finding out what's in the natural world is to go away, go out and blow away a shit ton of it. And then collect, have your servants collect it all up and then lay it out in the billiard room. And go, oh yes, look, before I arrived, there were many, many herons on this lake. <laughs> Seriously. I, I tell you what, one of these days, I'll go to the natural, his, I'll, I'll go to the Royal Armouries and I'll shoot some footage of it. Because it, it is the most mind-boggling thing. Like an awful yeah. lot of elephants and rhinos were, shat, were shot by people who would consider themselves natural historians. 
that it said it's essentially the biologists of their day would go out and just annihilate shit and then bring it back and go look aren't elephants interesting looking look at the surprise look on its face when I shot it through the head with an inch and a half caliber shell <laughs> <laughs> that's Victorian English right. people for you man they weren't to be trusted they, Jesus. Just, they went out and fucked up the world <laughs> So when, when they turn up in places like the Amazon and stuff like that, you saw a white British person and they claimed they were looking for plants and people didn't trust them. There's a reason for that. It's like they didn't help themselves. <laughs> they went and annihilated shit. I mean, and you know, they, yeah. they did things like stuff and mount native people so people could see what they looked like. And shit like that. It's unbelievable. In the British Museum, there's hundreds of thousands of Aboriginal <laughs> oh remains. God. I'm not joking. People went and collected people. Yikes. But, you know, it's just it's just unbelievable the, the way wow. that the mindset of people that just go, oh, we'll just go and get a pair and see if we can breed, you know, this fucking bird. Or we'll introduce stuff. I mean, the reason there are rabbits in Australia is down <laughs> to an English person who wanted something to shoot at. He smuggled in a pair of rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and now rabbits overran Australia. They just like, well, they, they they multiplied like rabbits. They got loose. Rabbits aren't even supposed to be in the UK. Yeah. Rabbits aren't from the UK. They're a transplanted species. Something so common in the British countryside, you see it all the time. Not from there. Um, the Romans brought them over to breed for meat because it's a really easy meat food. Mm. Really easy. Um, and uh, they weren't wild until about 1700. You didn't get wild rabbits. People kept them for food. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to need idea. to take a break. I don't know how long I'll be able to keep going on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we might want to fun. We've covered a few subjects, sooner. even though we didn't intend to ramble on. Or I didn't intend to ramble on. No, I think this show has been great. That is a big gun. <laughs> what? I just don't understand. This gun is... What? Two pound, six pound. And twelve pound shots. The punt gun, or which one are you talking about? The Davis gun. An aerial yeah, artillery. Yeah, the recoilless gun. That's insane. Yeah. You know, they don't build them like, like they used to. Like it's so insane. There's. Is that a Lewis gun mounted on top of it? Yep, range finding. <laughs> Have you yeah, seen the Lewis gun calm. go? Yeah. It's a nice it's a nice machine gun actually. It works really well. Wow. Imagine a firing a twelve pound shell from a biplane. Again it's a recoiler's gun, yeah. so it doesn't really matter. That's the thing about recoilers guns, they can be really lightweight because uh they don't need to. Uh, yeah. They don't need to deal with the recoil. That's interesting. Okay. Someone's possessed by Satan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless you live in a capitalist society where you're repossessed by Satan. Repo! <laughs> Repo your soul with the iPhone 10. Load you, Apple. Oh, they're just, they're just... It's just the not removable battery thing, I think, that really gets me. The unreplaceable battery. That it's is like, irritating. Oh, you've... Mine still hasn't died yet, though, and I'm over 10 years old. 
Yeah, but I've got I've got three batteries and two my... battery pack chargers for my uh... mobile phone. It's like well easy to charge shit up from. I know you can carry yeah. a, an external battery bank. That's fine. I know. I, it's just that batteries die, and if the battery in that phone dies, then no amount of unless you're gonna yeah. velcro the, the the power bank to the back of the phone, which should be really interesting. <laughs> you know, just like a right. refusal to let it die. You know, if unless you're brave enough, you can <laughs> replace any battery. Yeah, you, I mean, they, they, you can replace the battery, but it's like, you know, <laughs> PTRD 41. Yeah, it's the Russian version of the yeah. anti-tank rifle. Yeah. You know, they're really funny if they, if they uh, are uh, set up right, they should throw their shells. I mean, they're a single-shot rifle that, that has an auto-eject function. Yeah. Which is really funny if you don't if you don't know about it. So you've just shot your rifle, or you've just detonated your rifle, and then you look at the bolt and oh look, it's back. Fuck. <laughs> That's yeah. Except if you're not expecting That's it. That's cool. I've read stories about people where like they it. point out, hey, look at the bolt, and then you pretty much piss oh. themselves. Yeah, I mean, you could hurt yourself. You get your I mean, little bits you, in the way you, of it, but yeah. If you grasp the amount of pressure that is in one that is in the uh, that's in the barrel when it's firing, even a small gas leak will blow like flesh from your skull. So, so you're done firing, and oh look, the bolt is back. Yikes. Like all the way, the shell is out. Fuck, that's scary. <laughs> but then again, most of them yeah. are like World War II surplus, so the buffers on the back are not working right. That, so it doesn't really happen. All, so, well, it doesn't eject the shell anymore. It's just halfway unlock the bolt. Yeah. Hmm. I, like, I, I, I just really like a really high tech. Like a metal storm slave to a like a like a, a a head mount or something. You could just look at something, hold it in your vision, and hold a crosshairs a crosshairs on with a with like a little camera, and then just press a button from some other location. That thing just stops being there. The thing that you're shooting at just gets destroyed. Uh -huh. This would be really relaxing. It's like, <laughs> well, you're not armed. I I really am. I'm I'm armed remotely. Drones, so when this man. red laser points at you and I push this button, yeah. you know, we have a proper pink mist situation going on here. It will blow your head clean off your shoulders <laughs> wherever you are in relation to me. <laughs> if I'm looking at you, I can make it I can make you go away. Just have like a little AI slaved into it. You know. Yeah, with this person in front of me, this person needs to disappear. That like, boom. Have you seen uh, 13 no. Hours? Oh, well, at the at the beginning of this this movie, I'm not really giving anything away cuz this movie's not really about this, but um in the beginning of the movie, these guys are driving from the airport to their secret CIA base or whatever. Um they're 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 private contractors, but they have CIA handlers for whatever reason. I don't know. Anyways, um, they're heading back to the base and they come up from a roadblock from these, you know, partisan, uh, fighters, uh, Arabic. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what country it was, but anyways, the guy basically bluffs his way out of the situation because they only have a couple of pistols and these guys are armed with rifles and, and machine guns. And he basically bluffs his way out of the situation saying that there's, a, a drone overhead that could uh, destroy them. You know, just he, he just convinces them not to kill that them just by talking. Surprisingly well, if you know how to do it. So I thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you guys. What are some Ranger Stroke WOG films? I was gonna, I was gonna maybe, what well, I was gonna make a, um, oh, man. like a, like a almost a, a movie review. I was trying to think of the most ranger type or stroke 
films of all time? Well, most of mine are in that uh, fluoride in films uh, episode of oh, Everything right, yeah. You Know Is True that we did way back then. But there's some, I mean, yeah, obviously I there's been a lot of movies, movies released movies, since, and so I can look up my, think, my you know, list right now. In this movie. I was thinking the hunting. Yeah. Would definitely fit into that quality. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, there are I plenty of movies that I'd say this will teach Someone doesn't go complete retard. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that nobody ever does like survival really, you know, or it, dealing with a situation really, really, really well. You know, I mean, I, I, I think I quite, I'd, I'd say probably put Cast Away. You know, maybe TV series, but there, there again, nobody ever does it the way I would do it. Yeah. Um... That's what I mean. Is, is there a film where somebody properly does it the way, I mean, The Martian, I'd say, is probably the most Ranger type film. Because he is completely mm. screwed. Mm -hmm. He does, he does, you know, use his brain to get out of the problem that he's in you know like like his response to being marooned on Mars is the way we'd all like to think we'd respond I don't think he really does anything wrong mm, no not really whereas most, most of these sort of like people like survive in a terrible situation you're of the opinion that you could have done better like a properly, a properly I'm of the, of the opinion that they should have died yeah. from their yeah. own stupidity five minutes after the movie started. I, mean, I was thinking like things like The Survivors and The Colony as TV shows, <laughs> but the 1970s version of The Survivors, the thing that mm -hmm. annoys me about that is 90% of their problems is because they don't have comms. Most of the time that they're in trouble is because yeah. they can't communicate with each other and they can't coordinate their efforts properly. Well, let's see. The Omega Man with Charlton Heston. I would yeah. probably do pretty much good, what he would yeah, do. Not the worst part. part. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, so that's that's one no. I'd say that's definitely worth a watch. <laughs> we thought, you know, movies where you could look at it and go, yeah, fair enough. Um. Uh, have you seen no. Hostage with Bruce Willis? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's kind of a little bit specific because he's a hostage negotiator, but, you know, a lot of the things that he does in that movie, I'd probably do. Good movie that I like, but I don't know if it's like Rainier related and Spirited Away. Huh. I suppose that is somebody solving the problems with using their brains. It's interesting though, isn't it, that you think, you know, that some movies you like even though you think, oh, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done that. You don't often see a movie where you think that person did something correct, you know, appropriately well that they survived and they deserved to. My problem with movies is that I basically go like that's not how that works. <laughs> But also, you kind of think some of the times they don't do the right thing because it provides a certain amount of drama. Yeah. Whereas somebody just getting on with it yeah. and going, oh, right, okay, kind of screwed here. Oh, I need to think. Have either of you seen uh, Here Alone? No. It came out this year. Uh, a young woman struggles to survive in the woods alone after a mysterious epidemic decimates society. <coughs> uh, that one is pretty good. Pr pretty much do the same thing. Although, I don't think I would stay in yeah. my car as long as she did. But you know, other than that, everything. I mean, the Mist is that new TV series. The Mist is quite engaging. But I think you know, there's there's an awful lot of people being stupid in it where you just think yeah. oh, you know what I, d I don't know whether it'd even be a good watch if you just, just saw people getting on with it and just going right we need to organise our shit I mean there's a certain amount of that in Jericho 
Yeah, know. I was going to mention so that I was just one thinking, too. you know, maybe we could do some film reviews or some TV series reviews and go, look, there are flaws. There's always going to be flaws because dramatic tension. But there's a few really interesting points that these people make. Mm-hmm. That's what I liked about The Survivors. Somebody really, really thought about that. And I don't know if you've seen the 1970s version. Yeah. But I'd recommend it. Not I mean, yet. it's set... It, it, they don't have a lot of technology. They don't do a lot of things right. But there's always a few people that have got an idea of how it's going to have to work. And there's a few good conversations between characters about certain things like keeping law and order and, you know, what do you do about organisation and who should be in charge and stuff like that. And what happens if people have got different ideas to you? How do you cope with the social aspect of trying to mm-hmm. rebuild civilization? And there's a lot of that in it. You know, there's a lot of the danger of, you know, certain types of people getting a little bit of power. And, you know, certain types of people having different ideas. But I, I, I think that's probably the most Rangers TV show that has ever been done. Apart from maybe The Good Life. Have you seen um, Terminator yeah, the Sarah Connor Chronicles? Yeah, a few of those. And then it just... There's some yeah. bits in there that are good. I wouldn't say the whole series overall is good, but I'm kind of partial to the actors yeah. and story and stuff like that. But I mean, there are some there are some little survival yeah. bits in there that There's are also decent. a book. I don't know if you'll be able to get it. You should be able to get it on it as an ebook called My Side of the Mountain, and it's set during it's set during the mm-hmm. Depression. I've heard of that about this kid that just decides yeah. that he's too much of a burden on his parents and he can look after himself. Because he's got like two or three siblings, and he says mm-hmm. he's going to go off and like you know live in the wilds, and does it, and basically make does and mends almost everything that he gets. He just sort of like manufactures it, and goes like all oh, like Peter Pan's Lost Boys out in the American wilderness. That's pretty good. I think things like the ta- the Adventures of Grizzly Adams. I'd say the Waltons is probably quite Rangers friendly. I think I think we just called down um, Christopher McCandless oh. in, in the last episode yeah. or whatever. But I mean, <laughs> but but I, I really liked the I, I liked the movie. I'm sorry, I like the did. political expression the of wild. freedom, the way he challenged everything. You know, just went yeah, and he and he lived the he, he lived as the person he wanted to be. Now that's that's got to be worth yeah. something, even though it was horrendously cut short. I mean, the, the really tear-jerking yeah. bit where they interview the actual guy that sort of said, look, you can come and live with me. Mm-hmm. I get it. But come and live with me. We'll kick you out for Alaska so you can go next year. But you really want to wait until you know what you're walking into. Mm-hmm. And that guy was in tears. Yeah. Like, he really loved that kid. Yeah. And just thought he was doing absolutely everything. Really respected him. You know, just, I mean, you know, the guy wanted him for a son, basically. He was so impressed. Yeah. just like I'm going to fucking adopt you mate you're just absolutely got it dialed in but you mustn't go into this terrifyingly dangerous environment without knowing what you're doing I think that was a that was a, mm-hmm. a big tribute to the guy he must have been a pretty personable sort of a dude but it just annoyed me that that didn't have a good ending it, did, it annoyed me that yeah. a, a slightly more prepared person would have done it really well and then that would have been a really great story you know, I wanted to read that he, he yeah. studied his environment and then went and lived in it, and he's still out there somewhere. We don't know where he is. Would have been a fantastic ending to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas, whereas it's just it was yeah, such a I meaningless just, death. I, I wouldn't yeah. have eaten plants, for sure. If you know, I I would not risk that. I would not risk eating wild plants. Um, but uh, there are a few in this country I will always trust. I always go, yeah, I can sort that out. I can positively yeah. identify that. I can therefore eat it. And I try and eat plants I can identify as often as possible. Because it's, I think it's good training for you. It just you, your memory of it will be far stronger if you've eaten it and you, you're, you know, it was nutritious and stuff. But I think also kind of the, the knowing your ability to survive and and not getting past a point where you're in starvation mode like knowing where that line is and knowing you know i've got to get out of here i've got to move because sooner or later i'm not going to have enough strength to do it yeah that was a real shame i mean you know 
it's uh, you just think just for for want of a little bit of knowledge you'd be you'd be alive possibly yeah. but then something else would have come along I mean but it did point out that you know you can be smart and a precarious situation can always just finish you off randomly yeah so you know there's that you know you've got it does hammer home that point you know you, there's always going to be something that comes along that's why we've developed all these systems around us so we don't have to do that because it's you know life can be nasty brutish and short Mm -hmm. but I you know I would have wanted him to do better really well if anything he probably prevented dumb shit like this happening again yeah I mean it's it's a bit crude but now people who want to do the same thing they like if they start looking it up for any length of time they pretty much stumble across this story so yeah. they'll quickly figure out that yeah I need to get my shit together before I do this hmm. but what if he had succeeded I mean think mm -hmm. about the opposite like if he had succeeded well then probably the same there'd be way there'd be way more people taking that risk yeah. and going off the grid yeah with only a Swiss Army knife and a, and a copy of Chris McCandless's book. <laughs> but yeah, it is, it, that, that's quite a, a rangerly film. There are a few, you know, type things that you think, yeah. So my, I, I wanted to give that a, like a little shout out just to sort of see if I, if I start doing a, the odd film review. I'm just saying, look, you know, the thing to learn from this film is X. No, I think that's awesome. I would, but there's I would precious do few. I would definitely do it. I mean, I mean, even if we can find yeah. ones that are like examples of like totally what not to do or how to do it partially, you know, there's mm -hmm. some good ideas here and here and here. You know, I think they cope with this situation quite well, even though it's like acted. You don't really know how people are going to react. And it's, it's those ones where people have got to survive with other people that are usually the most telling. Because, you know, other people are probably the most scary, dangerous thing there are to humans. Other humans are the most dangerous things in their environment. Yeah. You know, there's very few places where the wildlife is more dangerous yep. than the people that you're with if they're stressed out or they've got a different idea to you. So, yeah. That reminds me. Um, there is a video series that the International Red Cross did uh, a while ago about uh, war surgery for uh, doctors that go help in war zones. Fuck. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, I can imagine it's, that's pretty grisly. In, in, in one like thing that I remember, it's like, this fellow trod on a mine, on an anti-personnel mine three weeks ago. And it's bad. I mean, on one hand, it's a bit interesting, like, how do you deal with that kind of bad wound? And it's very, I mean, it's it's stuff that if, as a doctor you need to know, like fresh wounds and infected wounds that are wounds that have been a couple of weeks old, you need to treat them differently. Uh, it's something that, well, you just don't go looking for it, don't watch it, but if you're into the martial stuff, yeah, just go yeah. look that up. That'd probably be quite a hard watch. But, oh, yeah. you know, if you expose it's yourself to the possibility nasty. of something, yeah. I can imagine that it would be fairly unpleasant. I mean, the um, first aid triage triangle that the army have is quite distressing. You know, if they're, if they're actually in a combat situation and what you've got to do in the case of certain, you know, wounds and stuff like that as a squaddy to keep your, you know, your injured colleague alive. There's an awful lot of stuff, you know, sort of like, okay, if, if, you've, if you've all been in like an IED explosion, this is how you triage, this is how you pick out the people that are most likely to survive. And that's pretty disturbing. You know, you're actually encouraged to sort of like, you know, pick, pick yeah. get, you know, ignore the people with the light wounds because you can deal with them in a little while. See to the people with sort of like moderate wounds and the people that are heavily wounded. You know, you might have to just like let die. Because if it, the moderately wounded guy might bleed out in the next five minutes, whereas if you sit staring at the well fucked up dude for those five minutes, then you're going to lose two people. Whereas you've got a chance to save certain people mm. and no chance at all, even if they're conscious and in a lot of pain. 
there are some wounds that you've got absolutely zero chance saving and you shouldn't attempt to if there's someone with wounds that are serious and life-threatening but you can actually save them in the field you know there's a lot of you can't do anything for this person type stuff in there that's pretty harsh actually i should i should uh kind of curtail that conversation there into um into current events like if there's if there's one thing that you can do being a good a good ranger is be a good witness mm. and uh you know everybody can do that at this point you know and you know everybody's got recording devices on them all the time so there's so there's that and also learn medical yeah. because the chances that you're going to uh, help somebody with first aid, medical equipment, trauma, trauma equipment is is far more likely than you know plugging the holes is far more likely than than the making them putting the holes yeah. in somebody. Yeah. So. Yeah, I got. I'd agree with that. I think the other thing that you um, would make a good ranger is, you know, the breaking the glut, breaking the ice. In that, you know, when something mm -hmm. happens and everybody's standing around and nobody knows what to do, to try yeah. and mentally prepare yourself for being the person that says, "Call an ambulance to someone," or, or move, yeah, run, move. get out of the way, Give back up, go, the, go over yeah. here. Just yeah. the person that does the first thing which makes people far more able to cope if it sounds like somebody's taking charge. So, you know, try and sort of put yourself mm -hmm. in like a high stress position, say if you've seen a car accident or something like that. Try and imagine that you're the, you know, just get it in your head that somebody has to act. And if you all stand around, nobody will act. So even if you suggest the wrong thing, it's better to start suggesting things and making people move and do things is really really important you know that's yep. a, that's a big life saver even if you don't know any medical stuff if you see an accident and everybody's just standing around be the person to call 911 or get someone to call 911 be the person that breaks that you know shock of, that a crowd gets where nobody does anything and then people die you can save lives by being the first person to act yep and you can be a good witness and get information and make sure that information is correct and it gets out to the right people. And so yeah, if so something forth. has happened and you see the car speeding away, you've got you know you're ranger enough to be carrying some phone with notepad or you've got your mobile phone in your hand. You can jot down the registration number of the car that's fleeing the scene. You know you can do things like that. You can say how you, you can see if you can see as big a picture of the situation as you can safely. Because any information yep. is going to be a help. Yep. Cool, we covered a lot there, didn't we? Indeed. In nearly three hours. Huzzah! Yes. Set the worlds to rights. But yeah, I mean, that's. I mean, if you are listen, if you have listened all the way to the end, that's what we're going to try and you're going to try and get these these things discussed which is trying to get you to think about you know situations that you may not be prepared for and, and so that you can act or have half a plan which is better than nothing a reasonable All understanding right. of, of what to do and when or a reasonable idea of what what you can do is going to save your life far better than spending an extra two hundred dollars on a knife yeah it's going to be far more effective and useful to you ideas are like really useful which is why there's going to be you know starting from this week's episode on friday there's going to be some philosophical bits um built into the rangers tv episodes because there's loads of acronyms and stuff like that and loads of useful little tiny one sentence bits of information that if you can get it to sink in they can really pound it into your head and have that as a as among the first things you think of in an emergency that are going to make your life a lot more, you know, a lot more effective, shall we say? And you're, you know, to promote competence. 
because I think that's way more important and way more useful than any kit. And I think what I'll do at the end of the season is I'll just edit together all of the philosophy bits. You know, so it's just that'd be cool. Like a ten-minute video that's just watch it a bunch of times, get it to sink in, and then when you're in a situation, you can start applying the bits and see what works. So you can apply ten kinds of philosophy to a problem and just go right. That's what I need to do. Out of my out of the magic ten things, the most appropriate one is this. You know, things like halt. You know, don't make a, a major decision if you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or thirsty. Yeah. When stop. You know, stop. You sit down. Or, um, take stock. Organize and plan. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sort of like you know, you must do this now. Just get it to sink in. So if you're in a, if you've been injured or you've you're, you're out somewhere and you're stuck there, you know, or you're lost, you know, things that will just kick in, like things that people remember from when they were a boy scout or some shit that ends up saving their lives. But that kind of thing, like the rule of threes. If you're in shitty weather and you think, oh, I'm going to be here over a night now, I wonder if I should go and, you know, hunt out some food. And you're like, no, that doesn't work with the rule of threes. I need shelter first. You know. I, I've got advice, too, for people um, who are uh, driving vehicles. Um, if you're in, like, an escape and evasion situation or, let's see, like, a evacuation situation or you're, like... Uh, what do you call it? Overlanding, you're way out in the bush or whatever, and you're having problems with your vehicle. Like as soon as you can get that thing started, run that thing until the wheels fall off. Don't turn it off. Like don't do anything. Like <laughs> just like don't. As soon as it starts, like just run that thing into the ground as as long as it's safe to do so. <clears throat> yeah, because I, I would imagine starting a, a, a modern combustion engine is the complicated bit. Yeah. You know, there's more things that can go wrong with the actual starting of the engine than maintaining the engine's performance or mm. keeping it as, as someone who works with a fleet of vehicles, mm. that is my that is my advice. I've had I've had so many problems, so many breakdowns, all that thing. I want, Start the I want damn you to thing be saying and that run on it video, into man. the ground. <laughs> I want a video of you in front of your truck just doing that, and we'll put that on the show. Yeah. Yeah. We've got Digital Whiskey's EDC on Friday's show. Mm. We've had Kevin's Electronics to EDC. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to get people to send in their work. And everyone's like, oh, you're going to blow the engine, blah, blah, blah. Well, I didn't blow the engine, okay? It's, mm. it's up and running again. It's working, so... And that's what I did. I drove that thing until <laughs> it would not drive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm thinking, you know, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to get a tow truck down a forest road. Mm. Y you know, it's just not going to happen. So I've got to get out of this. I've got to get off out of the bush. I've got to get out of here. That's the only way. Yeah, see, that's that's good advice. I remember when Sean Kennedy went, the earth wants to kill you. And it's yeah. like, that stuck with me. It's sort of like, yeah, the earth does want me dead. Just the planet, <laughs> its surface is going to try and kill me along with everything else. But the surface will do it a lot faster, barring accident or, you know, startling a bear. You know, that's, that's not like my number one killer is the planet itself will try and off me. Oh, we could have we could have stayed out there a long time, but mm. you know, we <laughs> Bree uh, packed like a million pounds of food, so I mean, we we could have <laughs> we could have stayed out there a long time. You just that wouldn't have got your truck back. Yeah, that wasn't the issue. The, the 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 other advice I can give you is, it's a a vehicle is like a safe. Okay, when you buy a safe, you want the safe to be more expensive than the stuff that's inside the safe. Oh yeah. So likewise, you want the car to be more expensive than all the shit that's in the car. Because yeah. if it breaks down and you're in the middle of nowhere and you can't cart all that shit by hand, you know, out to where you need to be. So, <laughs> so that was my problem. That was my mistake because, you know, I took like four thousand dollars worth of stuff in a five hundred dollar truck. That was my bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have that on tape too. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> we'll just have that like the Doug Stanhope intro, in, in, um, intro music. <laughs> Avagdu says, <laughs> "Don't fucking stop the truck." Yeah, <laughs> don't ever, don't, don't ever. ever stop. No, I don't get care. back home. There's babies, a shot of your house. Babies, as, little as dogs the, as, cross the yeah. road. Doesn't matter. Keep going. <laughs> You got to think like the guy in the LA riots that was driving that truck and then <laughs> exactly. stopped and they got out and they tore him apart. You got to on, on, and just not stop. Yeah. Let them know you're coming. Don't stop. Don't get out of the truck. Don't yeah. get out of the truck. Good advice. <laughs> that but man it... will never, ever stop for anything ever again. He's out there in the Midwest somewhere driving around, ignoring stop signs and all sorts of shit. Nope. <laughs> not going to stop. But that hasn't panned out for me well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it works. They'll get out of the way. It's a big truck. It works for armed convoys too. I mean, it, it yeah. just it, it applies to so many so many things. <coughs> just don't fucking stop. You just make make sure that the people in the truck are just are just sort of like wog enough to just go right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do any of this shit. You know, there's no way. You know, if if you know if vehicle three gets knocked out, then they're tough and nasty enough to fight their way out of whatever situation they're in we're still going on we might come back from in scout vehicles but we're getting this convoy home yep we're just going to blow away anything that gets in our way if anything twitches as as funny on this road we're just going to run straight over it just yeah yep don't stop the truck <laughs> nope <laughs> <laughs> this has been brilliant I, I will tell you what the setup is because I, I, you know, only the hardcore Ranger fans will be listening in this. I, I'm doing a science fiction sort of like backdrop for the philosophy sections. So, so I've I've got a beret and a black shirt and a black tie. So it almost looks like a Starship Troopers uniform. Nice. And I've got a I've got a green screen and I've found a science fiction like a Starship backdrop. Mm -hmm. And just before that runs for the philosophy bit, I've got a flyby by a sort of largish looking spacecraft past a planet. And I'm just going to have sort of like, you know, uh, a, a UESS ship, you know, um, scout ship, um, UESS Sean Kennedy. So it's like <laughs> on, on the starship Sean Kennedy. And I'm doling out all this advice looking like I'm in starship troopers. I mean, fucking nice. Nice. Because <laughs> I've just worked out how to do green screen, and I was like, "What would I do?" You know, because this was this was technology that I could never have done with before. Yeah, and it's now real easy to do with computers and stuff. Let's have some CG. Yeah, It'd be like it's it's all shot in my bedroom, and then it goes <laughs> CG you know, for no real reason other than I've just figured out how to do it. Awesome. <laughs> Listen up, Rangers. Take a knee. I have some shit to tell you. How's how's the. Um the display going so we can have the video chats it's on my list for this week i mean last week i had a mad productive week all right i've got so much so much stuff done like my my flat's tidy the studio's there all the kits accessible i got episode three out i got another episode of rangers radio to bed we did all sorts of shit last week and it was just like wow i did a lot of stuff and i'm kind of sitting in my flat and it's all tidy and i'm not wanting to make mess in it and and I learned how to do a few things, including the green screen. So the the next bit is the telepresence. Um, might be doing a like a pilot ish chat show thing mm -hmm. sometime this week. If Sam Sam's going to come over, the guy that did the review of the Bear Grylls survival kit, yeah. and uh, we're just going to shoot the shit and maybe do some um, review type stuff. Cool. Um, so that's coming, and then I will work on the telepresence thing. I just want to see if the sort of the chat show format. We'll see if we can get like a very basic one of those together, and then I'll work on that. But I've got this job does give me a load of time off, and now I'm waking up at a sensible time in the day, and I'm getting up and doing stuff, like getting like my life stuff sorted out, and then I'm having a few hours in which, I, because I'm awake and I'm kind of active, I'm then into doing the creative shit. So I shall yes definitely try and get that telepresence rig going because that would just be hilarious. Yeah. It'll be so much fun, and it will really engage people out in the community. Yeah, I think it's going to be good. Yeah, I don't know how it will go if somebody totally disagrees. If we get trolled, <laughs> I think we're too small to troll at the moment. So. Yeah, <laughs> if we start getting trolled, we might have to vet guests and Ruff. all sorts of shit. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll end up with the time cube guy. <laughs> 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 Reference there. 
Good reference. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's it. No, that's how it would go, wouldn't it? You'd end up with every crazy fucker with an axe to grind. <laughs> and it, oh, I remember listening to that thinking. Because they didn't, on that episode, they didn't talk about it. They just played. Sean just comes on and he just goes, oh, this is this t- guy I was speaking to who used to work for NASA. And I had a really interesting chat with him. And he didn't say that was some mad shit until the next week's episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember that happening in real time. So I had to, it wasn't until the following week that I got to find out that the time you got cut, Sean was just going, what the fuck was that all about? <laughs> that made yeah. no sense. Yeah. It was just like, I thought you were behind that for a bit. <laughs> I had a week of thinking, seriously, Sean, I've only been listening to you for about seven episodes and I'm deeply worried <laughs> that uh, you, you actually drank the Kool-Aid on that one. And then he was like, wow, that was messed up. And he and Sim are just joking about it going, no, that was fucked up. We should have totally uh, said something last week, but we couldn't bring ourselves to do it. Just wanted to think about all those people out there what, listening and going, what the fuck? For a week. <laughs> I really did wander around just going, I don't, oh, really? I can't, I can't see Sean Kennedy take it. I mean, yeah, he's got some wacky ideas and shit, but, but yeah, really? Time <laughs> is he, is he let that go? Well, because there are four of everything. Well, that's not a cube, is it? Cube's got six sides, dude. There's not six seasons. You can't do like, you know. You can't, Can you know, he do the Stewie voice again? Oh, there's not. Yeah. Oh. You're going to gonna maybe make a time cube? You're going to fix us? You're going to get it sorted? No, you're not going to, are you? Oh, just. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I was listening to that old episode tonight. I missed that. That was funny as hell. <laughs> oh. So we can't have that, really. Can't really have the David Ikes of the world lining up to be on the show. Not unless we get a rep for being really harsh. <clears throat> Probably be the first talk show in human history where somebody goes, "No, that you're just full of shit." It's a you can't, you've got you've got. It's to a go. good thing that when we did that reptilian episode way back then, I, I made clear that I was bored watching that <laughs> that lady, uh, mother goddess, talk about uh, the the menstrual cycle and reptilians or whatever the hell she was talking about. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it's just oh yeah this uh, i think we, uh, we'll have to have the same sort of caveat as as reviews like we'll do a review you can pay us for a review you can even send us stuff for free and pay us if you want to but we're going to answer honestly mm-hmm. so you best be believing if it turns up on my doorstep then we're going to properly hack it and if it's shit we'll yep. tell you be prepared for an honest review. And if we review. get a rep for that, yeah, be prepared for an absolutely honest review. I mean, in fact, one of the things in episode four is a baseline kit review. Mm-hmm. Like, your shit must be this good before we'll consider yeah. it good. This, this is the bar. You know, if you want us to say what a good knife it is, it has to be at least as good as any of this before we're impressed, just to let you know. So if you send in something that's really shit, it falls way below this bar. And we'll just do a, a, a battle of the kit and just say, right, okay, is it better? You know, it's a folding knife. Is it better than, you know, this Ganzo knife? Because mm-hmm. if it isn't, we're going to say. But yeah, oh, I'm so addicted to battle boxing. Really, so. <laughs> and I don't want to own any of it. You know, when they start pulling out the stuff uh, and the best ones ever, the one where you're absolutely glad that you don't own anything in this video. <laughs> Is probably the Bud K. Ones. Oh yeah, yeah. Bud K is awful. With the just, but just with the most horrendous knives. Here's my thirty dollar mystery box from Bud K, and all the knives look like they're made out of tin foil. <laughs> yeah. It's just like yeah. wow. You, you know what crack. I think they market that for? That whole magazine. Look, is my knuckle duster alien <laughs> hunting knife from Bud K. It's like you, oh, you know who no. they market that that magazine to? Felons. Who? No, people, yeah. seriously, like people who don't own that, guns, they 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 market that that magazine towards them. They're like, "Oh, look at all these yeah. scary, wicked-looking knives and and all this crap that's completely impractical." Oh. That that that's that's who they want to buy their knives. Imagine somebody trying to mug you with something <laughs> like that. It's like this is the zombie killer knuckle duster <laughs> knife folding. <laughs> With a with a a, a two twenty C stainless steel blade that's got pictures of skulls <laughs> on it. 
airbrushed onto it and you're just like it's oh like, that's no. gonna break when you try to stab no, me no, I'm, I'm gonna have to kill you with my <laughs> bare hands just because you've had the front to bring that would you even yeah. show that to me if you were a friend showing it to me i i would wonder whether it wouldn't be a good idea to chop off one of their finger joints <laughs> yakuza style just for showing it to me and said like zach i bought this it's like no i'm sorry man you've got to lose a, like a knuckle or some shit because you bought that with your own money you 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 know those are horrendous and that is that definitely falls into the you know shit i'm glad i don't own yep. category i'd be so <laughs> embarrassed i wouldn't even buy that to make someone cringe no because it would involve me buying it and i think every one of those sales encourages another com another company in taiwan to start stamping out shit knives oh they're horrendous and it just the whole knife of the month thing in these survival boxes is just so I'm going to get to the year, and instead of having like a useful collection of shit, I've got 12 fairly <laughs> crap knives that you managed to get cheap. You, you know, everything is really... Oh, this this month's one, one what was it? Self-defense. Yeah. And they got mm -hmm. a Kubatan, which was like highly suspect. It's not like something you can mm. carry openly. It's like a spiked Kubatan with a big ring mm. at the end. It doesn't disguise right. itself as anything. And the knife of the month was a giant karambit. <laughs> like, literally, the blade on this karambit was what like eight fuck? inches long. <laughs> like a karambit is a little knife used for opening up shit and doing tiny little tasks and a bit of whittling and stuff like that yeah. that sits in your boot, basically. That, that is unobtrusive until you need it. And this thing was a huge folding karambit. And I just thought, oh, I'd be so embarrassed to ever pull that out and, and just... I've got a knife. Really? Have you really, though? Are you sure? Have you had a look at it? Have you had, objectively, have you like looked at the design and gone, yes, this is a knife? You, and it's, yeah. I want it to look like a giant golden saber tooth claw. Yeah, and the blade's gold what the and the, the handle's black. Oh and that's their God. knife of the month. The most embarrassing <laughs> knife anybody's like ever Like you're in had. a 1970s kung fu movie or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's 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 it, it's it comes just slightly short. The only thing that can make it make it any worse would be like Chinese dragons <laughs> yeah. engraved on the handle. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. That's all you could do to make that knife worse. <sighs> well, I'm gonna try to go to bed. Yeah, yeah. we've hacked on everybody now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, it's been a good chat. All right. We'll put this up. And hopefully it'll all be. I'll, I'll I'll play with the volumes, but it's been fun. So I've been V. We've had a bag of yep. whiskey. And set to, let us know what you think. For for Christ's sake, we'll keep doing this shit if you if you like it. But uh, yeah, if you hate it, you know, mm -hmm. let us know that too. But yeah, I th we've possibly done some interesting stuff. Well, hopefully it was vaguely useful for someone, or hopefully it just got you yep. through doing the housework. If you're just ironing <laughs> or something, or taking out the trash. Or going to food shopping or something like that. What you needed was just some vaguely sensible people just going, no, this is fucked up shit. Yeah. yeah. And I'm so glad we weren't recording at the very beginning of this when we were having a chat because yeah. it got a bit dark. <laughs> you need you need uh, V well, of days. Undo and, uh, and Digital Whiskey here in, in your headspace. You know you do. You need us talking to you. Yeah. You know. Influencing oh, scary, you. Isn't it? There's going to be someone someone out there just sitting in quiet rage, just going home from a job they hate, sitting down opposite a wall of guns, just putting us on, just to calm himself down so he doesn't go mental, or she doesn't go mental, rampaging through the streets, killing people for being stupid. Don't do that. I know, don't do that. If all it takes is a bunch of crazy people from different areas of the world <laughs> <laughs> to calm you down, then we'll keep doing Soothing. It. Soothing voice. This has, been, this has been your reality <laughs> check for the day. <laughs> Remember, if you say, am I crazy, you're probably not crazy. <laughs> crazy people never ask that. Crazy people are fairly certain they're totally sane. If you're, if you're questioning yourself occasionally, you're still sane. Man, that is the point of the century right there. Yeah. <laughs> the moment you stop asking, then, then you should really have a lie down and a stiff drink or a bath or something. Or listen, look at some pictures of kittens on the internet, some shit like that. You know, and if we can all laugh about this kind of shit, then we're, st <laughs> we're still okay, doing okay. <laughs> yep when I'm wearing that orange jumpsuit and I'm in you know obviously a tropical country <laughs> with a bag over my head and somebody's asking me if I want a Quran oh no 
<laughs> that we had at least one listener. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. I think we'll end it there. I think. Okay. <laughs> night, night, all. Sweet dreams. Thank you.